allegiance. And everybody can stay unmuted or unmute yourself so that we can share in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, all, let's honor our country. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to, and the, to Republic the Republic for which, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thank you. And now if we could please, Ms. Bloom, uh, explain, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Rubacalva, the uh, Spanish interpretation for today. Thank you. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bi-directional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you don't have to click on anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are on a laptop or a desktop, you will see a globe at the bottom right of your screen please click on the globe icon that says interpretation and select English. If you are on an iPad or a similar device, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear and speak only one person at a time and speak at a moderate pace as the interpreter will be interpreting simultaneously into the other language. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice Interpretation, Interpretación. Haga clic ahí y seleccione Spanish, Español. Si está usando un iPad o dispositivo parecido, Localice el, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en donde dice Language Interpretation, Interpretación de Idiomas, y elija Spanish, Español. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso moderado, ya que la intérprete estará interpretando simultáneamente al otro idioma. Are there any questions? Has everybody selected their language? If there are no questions, we will begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now uh, we get to move to item C4, which is announcement of closed session actions. And the board took two actions in closed section, session, uh, two appointments, in fact. The first one is a school safety coordinator. Um, and so I'm pleased to announce that Jennifer Belacious has been approved as our new school safety coordinator. The motion was made by myself, Ms. Caps, and seconded by Sims, Ms. Sims Moten, and it was passed unanimously. So that is our new, she will be our new school safety coordinator. The second item that was taken up in closed session, uh, much excitement here around, um, is to announce that the board accepted the recommendation for an appointment of superintendent uh, the motion was made by Ms. Munoz and seconded by Dr. Reed and passed unanimously to appoint Ms. Hilda Maldonado as our next superintendent here at Santa Barbara Unified School District. Ms. Maldonado would be here in person, but she is joining us by Zoom. I'm going to first do, we're gonna do a round of applause and then each of my colleagues uh, will say a few words and then we'll turn it over to Ms. Maldonado. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's see. I see Ms. Sims Moten first. Um, if you'd like to speak. Sure. <laughs> uh, I was trying to hear all that loud applause out there. So uh, yeah. we might get to do that at the end. Everybody unmute and do that loud applause because it certainly is worthy of that. And um, I just want to appreciate the process and you know, uh, the difficulty in the process. And I guess that's a good thing to have, you know, such great and qualified candidates coming and wanting to be a part of Santa Barbara Unified School District. So that says a lot. Um, and, you know, in the process, it's like starting with the end in mind. And did you actually get there? And I would say that we did. I mean, we got pushed to make sure we were clear as to what the needs are, keeping the needs of the district in front of us as we were making the choices and going through that. 
and Miss Maldonado was with, it, with us every step of the way in regards to that. The one thing I would like to share, other than her just, you know, enthusiasm and just her vision uh, with what she looks for and want to look toward uh, at the district, is that one thing that struck me with regards to culture, she said, um, that it made me think that she's saying, I want to know and appreciate the difference in cultures. Even sometimes the example she gave down to what a word means. We may assume that yes means the same thing in every culture, right? But she shared that yes may mean yes in America. Yes, I'm going to do that, right? And that's a definite we're going to go forward. But in other cultures, it may mean maybe, not sure. <laughs> and then also, then she went further to say, it might mean, let me think about it. So I appreciated that. And we have the differences. We have such a diverse uh, population of students and in our community. So that's, that's really crucial to be able to look at that and to see that. And we know that her hands are going to be full coming here uh, with the district of all the challenges and opportunities that are here. But her hands are also wide open to receive what, what we have here. And I just appreciate her being open and transparent and willing and ready to work and get down with it. Because I think it's really important that we don't leave everything to the leader. We put the leader in with the team and we want to make sure that's a strong team around her and that supports her and welcomes her. So welcome, Mrs. Maldonado. Good to see you again. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. And I got so excited, I jumped and I didn't really give a proper introduction. So let me go back before I turn it over. <laughs> so <laughs> apologies. So uh, I'll just explain um, that um, Ms. Maldonado is currently the Associate Superintendent of Leadership Development and Partnerships at just a small little district to the south of ours, <laughs> Los Angeles Unified School District, which happens to be the second largest in the entire country. Um, she came to this country, she's an English learner herself, uh, as 11 years old and was motivated through that positive experience of le learning English in our public schools uh, to become herself a bilingual teacher. She's been a classroom teacher. She's been a principal. She's worked with principals. She has led big teams. And right now, you know, given the reality of what we are facing on a daily basis, unprecedented, unimaginable decisions and resources for our school district. She has been at the helm of leading the LA Unified School Districts, so many of their programs that are helping families every day, including the grab and go program where they've served 21 million meals. Uh, she's in charge of partnerships for that entire district. And so she just impressed us with both of her background, her real life experience, her intellectual experience, her work ex expertise, um, her humor, um, her graciousness, uh, the fact that she spoke a few times about her college age sons who were studying in the next room over as she was interviewing with us over Zoom and, and how excited her and her husband are about the prospect of relocating here in Santa Barbara. She's participated in Courage to Lead here in Santa Barbara. And I was just so struck by the way in which um, she will inspire, I believe, the students of this district, 44% uh, of whom are English learners. That's a, a real part of who we are, who our character is, and the fact that she is such a success story as an English learner and has taken it upon herself to build a career. And I'll just share that when I had the privilege of being the board president, which during this special time in our district, to share with her the news that she had been selected, um, she said, you've made a little girl's dream come true, you and the board. So that just means so much to me. And I'm just wonderful. It's wonderful to have Hilda Maldonado here. And now I'll turn it back over to any of my board colleagues who want to speak. Ms. Ford is Ms. Ford. Oh, thank you so much. That was great. Uh, it truly is an honor to have Hilda join us. And it is also historic. I have never before heard of hiring, interviewing a superintendent on Zoom. And at first for us, it was a truly daunting uh, challenge, but truly Ms. Maldonado's brilliance was an inspiration throughout the entire process. Hilda is clearly a courageous, inspiring, tireless leader that we can lift up, we can look up to, and we can learn from. I love that she has an easy smile and a delightful laugh too. We set out to hire the best, and I believe Hilda Maldonado is the best. 
This is also very historic because it's incredibly rare to have an all-woman board working with a woman superintendent. So I don't mean to sound sexist, but we are going to do great things. And I'm thrilled to be part of this historic moment and welcome Hilda Maldonado to the Santa Barbara Unified team. Excellent, thank you, Ms. Ford. Dr. Reed. Yes, I, um, I'm just so excited. Uh, enthusiasm and excitement just ever since we we made the final decision it was like it just felt so right it just it was like home it was like this is what it's supposed to be and i would like to welcome um miss maldonado to our district and during this unprecedented time i really believe you are a beacon for moving our district forward and i know you will provide equitable access to all students to achieve academic success and career readiness. I mean, you made that very clear in the work that you've done and that that is your passion. And so that really is powerful to me. Um, Laura had spoke or Ms. Capps had spoke of your background. When, one of the, some of the things that sort of rose up for me was as associate superintendent currently of leadership and development and partnerships at LAUSD, you come with an ability to create a vision that will motivate and create cultures of collaboration. That vision is exciting and um, powerful in this challenging time, but I feel that you have the chops to do it. You have <laughs> the background, the passion, and the calm. I really appreciated your calm demeanor um, and, and how you approach things. Your lived experience as a bilingual student and your experience in directing multilingual and multicultural education are critical for our district. And um, I believe your approach, um, your focus on the assets-based approach and strengths of students um, bringing to culturally responsible classrooms, I think it's gonna be an incredible bridge that will gap um, that will bridge our gap in literacy for our students. So I believe you bring so many different talents and skills to us. And finally, what was clear was your ability to create partnerships with businesses and philanthropy and other community organizations. And I think that's vital in this role that you are taking on to be able to connect and be a liaison to our community. And I think um, you have that wonderful opportunity I wanted to just make a noise and support the community panel that was involved in the process of this and all of the voices that came forward in people, parents, students, teachers, um, administrators, who all came forward with what their hopes were for um, our superintendent. And I'm also proud of the process and rigor and I mean rigor, <laughs> as we <laughs> participated in as a board to find our new leadership for this district. And I really appreciate my five women team board and am thrilled to have a woman leader. And here we go, women in leadership. I mean, this is it right here. And I just feel, um, I feel it's an honor and privilege to have you and I welcome you with with just glee and passion for your next move to find out where we're going in this district. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Dr. Reed for acknowledging the community input. And it's an important piece that hundreds of people really participated in this process. And I do also wanna thank um, our search firm, uh, McPherson and Jake Jacobson, uh, Ben Johnson and Dr. Jail Adams, who I believe might be uh, watching us here, as well as uh, the wonderful Craig Price. So it was a huge team effort. And now we're at this wonderful culmination point, And I'll turn it over to the person who made the motion, Ms. Munoz, to, uh, to speak. Thank you, President Capps. Um, Hilda Le Leticia Maldonado, <laughs> I welcome you um, sincerely. I know that the community will join us in welcoming you to Santa Barbara Unified. Um, being an English learner myself, when I went to kindergarten and through first grade and, and such, um, I certainly, I heard, you know, I heard your story and I appreciated 
you sharing that with us in addition to the huge, you know, as my colleagues are saying, the huge wealth of expertise that you're bringing to our district. I look forward to ensuring, you know, that all voices of all students are heard um, and that they are included in addition to our parents and our community. And I know that you will be with us hand in hand We'll be meeting with you and, you know, looking at how to best serve the needs of our district. Um, and sincerely, bienvenida. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, now, uh, again, we wish this was in person. I, I continue to say that, but uh, the smiles are radiating through the screen here. And it's my privilege and pleasure to turn it over uh, to our next superintendent, Ms. Hilda Maldonado. Thank you, everybody. I wasn't sure if my uh, mute button was on or off. You're on. And good evening, buenas noches. I would like to thank Board President Laura Capps, Board Vice President Dr. Reed, Board Member Munoz, Board Member Simpson, and Board Member Ford for your trust in me as your next superintendent of Santa Barbara Unified School District. I'd like to acknowledge the board members' commitment and care during the selection process and your tough questions about my leadership, my experience and education, all in a virtual environment. We are truly living in extraordinary times and all across the country we are seeing evidence of the immense inequities in access to a quality education program for our most vulnerable student populations. Our English learners, our students with disabilities, our children living in poverty, the loss of jobs, food insecurity, and the digital divide will have lasting impacts on education for our students. These are and will continue to be, there are and will continue to be many changes in education. I want to assure this board, the teachers, parents, students, and community, that the promise of a quality public education will not go unfulfilled in Santa Barbara Unified. Public education delivers more than academics. It changes lives, it improves society, and creates opportunities for students to thrive, and in some cases like mine, it provides a way out of poverty. As I promised during my interviews, I'm ready to lead with an equity and excellence lens. I'm here before you today because of the opportunity of a great public education, and I am committed to the following during my superintendency. I'm committed to student safety and achievement as our highest priority. And this includes having the devices, the internet access, and all the tools necessary to succeed. I'm committed to collaborating with the board, the school community, parents, and partners to maintain a caring and inclusive school community. I'm committed to a professional culture for teachers and staff. I'm committed to building relationships that focus on school environments in the yet to be defined classroom, whether it's online or in person or a hybrid of both. I'm committed to providing equitable opportunities for all students. The lives of parents, teachers, and students have been disrupted in ways that none of us could have predicted. We will need to be agile, flexible, and prepared to meet these new challenges under ambiguous and uncertain conditions. At some future point, I would like to be able to introduce all my family members in person, but here we are all quarantined together with me here tonight and the people that I lean on to support my commitments to the Santa Barbara community. First, my husband, Cameron, I'm just gonna have him peek in really quick, Good, who has made it so easy to focus on my work in school with his patience and care for all of us at home. Next is my son, Joshua, who will be graduating. Bring your head in there, there you go. Who will be graduating from CSUN this fall and who reminds me to take a break every once in a while and watch a film with him. He's studying filmmaking. Last, my youngest son, Ari, who is transferring to UC Irvine in the fall and who ensures we all have family time. They are my strength, my purpose, and my support system. To everyone in the audience, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm looking forward to meeting all of you in person or at minimum online. I am excited to, and ready to work with all of you and most of all honored to join your community. Lastly, I wanna thank Superintendent Matsuka for his years of service to Santa Barbara and wish him all the best in his retirement. I look forward to leading this district as we collectively navigate a new education system that ensures all students are prepared for life, college, and career. Public education made a difference in my life journey, and I wish to do the same for all our students. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Quisiera decirles todo en español, pero por ahorita lo que quiero decir es estoy honrada y estoy muy um, 
animada a conocerlos a todos ustedes en su comunidad. Thank you. All right, everybody on the floor. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> raise, the room. raise the room. Thank you so much. That was beautiful comments. Uh, I, our hearts are full of hope and excitement. This is an, indeed a new era of education that you're helping us, leading us, and ushering in here tonight. And also to thanks, Mr. Matsuboko. There'll be more time for that. Just to let everybody know, uh, Ms. Maldonado is anxious to be here. She'll be joining us in full on July 1st. Uh, in the meantime, we have some things in the works, including a potential, uh, we're working with the student body presidents and representatives from each school to do a Q&A that's open to everybody on Zoom, of course, uh, the public, perhaps on Friday. So more details about that and more information about her will be on our website shortly. So stay tuned. This is just the beginning and we're thrilled with the way it started. And I'm just one last shout out to the board for a wonderful process, five months, over 50 candidates lots of hard work, and here we are with the best choice we could possibly have, Ms. Hilda Maldonado. Thank and you. that concludes item C4, uh, uh, reporting out of our um, closed session action. So I will turn it over to Mr. Matsuoka for the superintendent's report. Yes, that was just beautiful to watch. Absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the process and the outcome that you've engaged in. So thank you for your service. I, I know how much work it is. Um, and you've been working very hard behind the scenes on behalf of us, your community, your school district. So we have one other introduction and that is uh, assistant principal appointment at San Marcos High School. That's uh, Dr. Annalise Alvarez. And board, you got acquainted with Dr. Alvarez uh, was about a year ago and we hired her as a Dean of Students and she has served well at San Marcos High School. And as I made my comments to Dr. Alvarez, well, you had a year long interview and they liked you and they picked you. So, uh, you know, there's nothing more gratifying than having your staff experience you and say, hey, we, we want you to continue your work in the role of assistant principal. So uh, someday I'd love to get a glimpse of your musical talent. Um, when I was going through your resume and I clicked on some stuff, I said, Gee, folks, we have a Grammy Award winner among us. So someday we need to bring that out in her work. So I um, want to uh, invite Dr. Alvarez to make a few comments and um, then ask the board to also welcome her. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, very happy to be here. I'm very excited and welcome to our new superintendent. Um, uh, I, I definitely want to start by with a little bit of gratitude and say, um, uh, like, uh, was just said a little more than a year ago, I met with, uh, Fran Wagonick and Sean Carey, who sat me down and said, you've never been an administrator before. We don't think we're going to interview for anything, but keep a lookout. There may be other things coming up. And, and lo and behold, a couple months later, the Dean position opened and, I applied and it really felt uh, felt good um, to be hired and then to be offered to be Dean of Student Engagement at my alma mater. Um, I graduated from San Marcos High School now 24 years ago and uh, I left at 18 and went to college in Los Angeles and taught in Ventura County. I taught in uh, Nevada. I taught in Toledo, Ohio and studied education across the country and it was really nice to come home. Um, and it meant a lot to not only to come home, but also to um, be able to work at the school I graduated from. And it had been really special this year and something really special to me. Um, so some gratitude also to Dr. Glazer, who's just been a phenomenal mentor this year. And really, when I brought up the idea of, um, of applying for the assistant principal job, really pushed me in leadership leadership roles as I was working out of the dean's office to um, really start to flex some of the skills that I felt I already had, but didn't know as a new leader how to, how to work on it. So uh, absolutely right. I feel like I've been sort of interviewing at least since January in, uh, in really um, allowing the, the teachers and staff at San Marcos to get to know me a little bit better and, and know what I'm capable of. 
Um, this particular position of AP uh, that takes care of athletics and activities is really right in my wheelhouse. I, I, I spent my entire career teaching high school band, other music courses, being a coach, activities, uh, uh, club advisor, and teacher leader, teacher mentor, all these things that engulf this position that opened at San Marcos High School. And that was really uh, launched by my experience at San Marcos High School, where I was involved in all of these things. Um, uh, you know, King's Page and, and Mock Trial, and uh, I was almost a lawyer because of Mock Trial. I went the music route instead, but you know, musicals and band and, and, and basketball and, and for that to launch into a really great career that I feel so blessed to have and then to be able to step into leadership role at my alma mater, it just really feels like it's come completely full, full circle for me. I'm so happy to be home um, and I'm so happy to be able to give back to the school that got me here. I'm so happy to give back to the city of Santa Barbara and to the district that helped raise me. Um, on a personal note, um, my father passed away uh, 13 years ago this month. And it took a long time for me to really dig into the things he told me as I was growing up. But one of those was to get out of Santa Barbara, go get educated, go experience the world, and then come back and teach the same people that you grew up around that they can also do it too. And so on top of all the great things that I feel that I can give to this particular position at this particular time at San Marcos High School, I'm really happy that I can stand here and say, I, I've done it. I'm here and I'm ready to really make a difference in this new role. Um, San Marcos has such a, a long history of athletics and activities and co-curriculars. Um, as, and, and what I've always loved about it is the balance between those things and the importance of academics has always been there. I remember that 20 plus years ago when I was a, a student there. And it's evidenced even now, like the seven CIF academic championships that we were just awarded, that we still have that balance. So I'm very excited to step into this role and, uh, and, just, and just work and give back. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Let's do, we're doing, we're doing applause tonight. So welcome, not, uh, welcome, continue welcome. And we're so happy that you're in this role. Congratulations. Okay. Uh, excellent. So now, uh, unless Mr. Matsoka, if you have anything more, uh, we will move on to item six, which is board comments and correspondence. I think you're good. Uh, so I'll turn it over. Board comments or correspondence in addition to what we've just done. Any other comments that the board might want to make? Seeing none. Oh, Ms. Ford. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, I can't believe how fast the changes are happening here at home and across the nation, even globally. Uh, it really does make your head spin. And, I cannot help but reflect once again on all my educator colleagues and friends who are just doing their best to keep up, to persevere, to continue to be creative, even as they deal with their own personal, economic, and social and emotional issues. And I just want to send a big, uh, a big grateful, um, emotional uh, thought out there to all of you. I'm also humbled by the ways that I continue to hear about um, within our community, folks, both young and old, are reaching out to help young people. And it's so necessary at this point. Um, I wanted to share with all of you a statement that was made on a recent tele television panel about distance learning. The speaker at that point said that, yes, access to computers and other devices are essential. And yes, accent access to the internet is essential, but there's another type of access that is also essential during distance learning times. And that is access to an adult who can encourage, cheer you on, listen, and provide academic help. And the teachers I know feel this need for this type of access very personally, these days especially, because some students just need a lot more guidance. And that's why I just wanted to give a shout out to lots of new organizations, both formal and informal that are out there, like the free online tutoring program that was designed by our own alumni, Maggie Miller, called Tutor the Future. 
And I just challenge all of us to try to find ways to reach out to students to support them one by one at this challenging time. This uh, is not going to go away soon and they deserve it. And let's also just remember May is Mental Health Month. Thanks. Yes, Dr. Reed. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Just briefly, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge all of the principals that are working so hard to pull off graduation next week. Uh, I just think kudos to them and Ms. Barnwell and all of the work she's doing to collaborate and work together and the, the cabinet team, everyone coming together because it's a fluid process and it could change up into um, the actual moment. Uh, I know Ms. Barnwell shared with, that with me today. It's an ongoing process, but behind all of it are the principal's desires to really provide the best experience that we can in the situation that we're in for our students. And I just want to acknowledge that it's not easy and also acknowledge how challenging it is for our students. But um, Ms. Sims-Moten and I had a chance to participate at La Cuesta's um, uh, video taping process today and hearing some of the students speak and seeing the excitements on their face and realizing that even though we're in this state that we're in and it is going to be Zoom primarily or wherever it is, that the passion and excitement is there and we so, so are excited for all of you and proud of all of you for the hard work that you're doing. So um, kudos to everyone to bring this forward next week. Excellent, any other comments or correspondence? I want to take the opportunity to, to do one more thank you that I meant to do, and that is to Ms. Sandra Trujillo. She helped support our search flawlessly, always with a smile, always unruffled and kept things moving with a lot of different moving parts. The same way that she puts these meetings together now that are in a whole new <laughs> dimension. So thank you, Sandra, really so much for how well you handled all of those five months of many candidates working with, the, with, with Ben Johnson and Dr. Daryl Adams. It was truly amazing. So one more applause for you <laughs> as uh, really heartfelt thank you to you. Uh, as we turn it over to you, because you're now managing, uh, on top of, again, everything else, public comment uh, in the way that we do it now through the phone. So I will turn it over to you for our public comment. Thanks, Mr. Hill. Yes, it's, it's been a pleasure working with you in this process. So um, appreciate your comments. Um, and we do have three speakers this evening on this item. And uh, I will start with Mr. Paul Rimmey. Paul, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. You hear me? Can yes, you? perfect. You may well, begin. Uh, I just want to congratulate Hilda from Maldonado for being our new uh, superintendent and look forward to a peaceful and uh, eventful uh, relationship. <clears throat> well, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Actually, good evening, board members. Jacqueline, Laura, Rose, Wendy, and Kate. Uh, once again, our classified unit has been disrespected. This issue has been on our back burner for us since April when Mr. Tangway announced his decision to cancel American Fidelity. My questions are as follows. Why did Mr. Tangway cancel American Fidelity without giving them the opportunity to address his issues? Why would anybody uh, make anyone make a change to an insurance provider that has a history of over 40 plus years with CSEA? When is the lack of collaboration with us going to stop? Why was Mr. Tangaway unaware that SBTA has had two payroll slots? SBTA has two payroll deductions, which allows them to keep their long-term disability and American fidelity. Where's the parity with the teachers to give CSEA two choices like the teachers and keep American fidelity or enroll in a new plan? What happens to each member's pre-tax flex spending plans? What happens to members' long-term disability, which is not available in the new plan? 
Why would anyone conclude that this trusted long-term company has not properly serviced the SB Unified account? Why hasn't Mr. Tangway honored our cease and desist letter that we sent April 28th? Where is the trust issue that, uh, why is there a trust issue that still continues? There's no cost to the district uh, to provide two choices like the teachers. Mr. Tangway has written, and I quote, as I understand employees who wish to retain American Fidelity plans can still do so, but the billing aspect will be different. We believe this is misleading. Mr. Tangway has written, and uh, excuse me, uh, according to CNCA, districts have tried this new AFLAC plan and have switched black to American Fidelity after a couple of years, causing disruptions. We conclude that Mr. Tangway was responsible for making this unwarranted decision to drop American Fidelity. Three seconds. Why in these uncertain times would anybody place another fixable burden on our CSEA members? To address this disparity, we asked the board to remedy this issue by asking the district to furnish CSEA chapter 37 with a second payroll deduction so we can keep American Fidelity and not disrupt several hundred of our members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. You're welcome. We Next, we have Ms. Rita Newhouse. Uh, Ms. Newhouse, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Okay. You have three minutes and I will give you a 30 second warning. You may okay. begin. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. As a professional of professional of 22 years in the Santa Barbara teaching community and a member of SBTA, I am extremely dissatisfied that ultimately it was the school board that single-handedly made the decision regarding the spring semester grading policy instead of the professionals working in the field. In electing to act in a non-inclusive, non-collaborative manner, blatant disregard was given to the people it impacted the most, the students and teachers. This policy played out as follows. Students who were passing on March 13th stopped attending and participating in classes. Students received the message that it was okay to walk away from a commitment rather than seeing it through to the end to the best of their abilities. Students lost out on the valuable instruction that would have made transitioning to the next grade and its level coursework easier. Giving strictly credit no credit would have been a great equalizer amongst our students. It would have lived up to the SB Unified Credo, every child, every chance, every day. Our students have so many issues regarding access, and that is with our district IT staff doing the best job they can. Not every student has strong Wi-Fi, a distraction-free room to work in, an adult at home to advocate or help tutor, nor the emotional intelligence to get through the online coursework day after day. The school board needs to listen to the recommendations of the professionals working in the trenches. We are the front line, essential workers who are invested in ensuring that our students are met on a daily basis, be they academic, social emotional, nutritional, or in any other realm. The opinions, ideas, and suggestions of Santa Barbara's educators deserve equal weight in situations such as these when policy is developed which will impact our students and our profession. Thank you. New, new house. Um, next we have Mr. Travis Maniak. Um, are you there? Hello. Hello, Travis, are you there? Yes, hello. Okay, yes, you have three minutes and I will give you a 30 second warning. You may begin. Okay, good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, as a teacher in the Santa Barbara community and a member of the SBTA, I would like to echo Ms. Newhouse Zagletti's dissatisfaction with the school board single-handedly making the decision regarding the spring semester grading policy instead of working with the professionals in the field, as she had mentioned. In electing to do this, there was disregard given uh, that impacted the people, it, the, excuse me, was given to the people impacted the most, the students and the teachers. So to, to reiterate how this policy played out, 
again, students who were passing on March 13th stopped attending and participating in classes. Families were confused and a lot of the counselors time and energy were used to clarify the policy when their time could have been better utilized um, during these difficult times. Um, many students were trying to use this time to find ways to beat the system and figure out which grades they could elect to have to help their GPA and then just get credit for other classes. Uh, students received the message again that it was okay to walk away from a commitment rather than seeing it through. And students lost out on valuable instruction that would have made transitioning to the next grade and its level of coursework easier. So giving strictly credit, non-credit would have been a great equalizer among our students. We are big proponents of equity. It would have lived up to the SB Unified Credo, again, every child, every chance, every day. <clears throat> With the many issues that our students already face, let alone during these difficult times, and that with our district IT staff doing the best job they can. Not every student has strong Wi-Fi, a distraction-free room to work in, an adult at home to advocate or help tutor, nor the emotional intelligence to get through the online coursework day after day. <clears throat> the school board needs to listen to the recommendations of the professionals working in the trenches. We are the front lines of the future, essential workers who are invested in ensuring our students' needs are met on a daily basis be they academic, social, emotional, nutritional, or in any other realm. Again, the opinions, ideas, suggestions of Santa Barbara's educators deserve equal weight in situations such as these when policy is developed, which will impact our students and our profession. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, President Cap. that concludes public comment. Thank you so much. Thank you to our members of public that have spoken uh, during this section. I know we have a few more in the other parts of the agenda, I appreciate it. So now we move on to item D A, the acceptance of donations. I need a motion, please. I move to accept with gratitude the donation. Thank you. Ms. Munoz seconds. Yes. Excellent. All in favor. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you to all who have donated in recent months. And now uh, we move on to the consent agenda. I believe we have, Mr. Trujillo, we have a, um, a speaker for a few items in the consent agenda. Is that correct? That is correct, Ms. Ms. Caps. We have uh, Ms. Sheridan uh, Rosenberg wanting to speak on item E1, E2, and E6. Excellent. Ms. Rosenberg, uh, thanks for wanting to speak. Would it be okay with you rather than have you dial in three different times? We'll just let you speak to all three items. <laughs> Uh, perhaps in a condensed period of time. Ms. Rosenberg, can you hear us? Ms. Rosenberg, can you hear us? Hello? Well, let's, uh, while she gets set, I can just ask my board, the board members if there are any uh, items. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, perfect. Okay, I, I, sorry, I had my microphone on mute and I was waiting for a phone call. Yeah, I'd be happy to speak to all three. I actually planned on doing that. So congratulations to Hilda. So excited to work with her. This is great news. So good job, guys. Really excited. She seems Splendid. So congratulations, everyone. And I know it was very challenging doing this all, all of this remotely. So thank you. Um, and then I, I, so let's start with, I guess, E1, 2, and 6, combining them all together. So I'm, I'm in the majority. I think we're all very, very concerned about the budget shortfall, which is in the multiple millions. And I'm confused why we're spending $25,000 and giving it to United Way for any reason, um, much, or even giving Ventura County $18,500. I'm wondering if we could see a way through that. Maybe we could get a private donor to uh, subsidize this, but I really don't think the district can afford it. And I certainly don't want to sacrifice the programs, but I'm just wondering if we could work through a creative way to come up with funding other than out of the school budget. And now speaking to E6, approval of a school climate counselor. I, you know, I, I really think it's time for us to take a hard look at the, um, 
staffing, which is very top heavy, and wondering why we are prioritizing bringing in a, um, you know, someone who's definitely going to be making north of six, you know, six figures and on up for, um, you know, a position when, you know, kids are at home right now. And I really think that this is an opportunity now that Hilda's coming on board to sort of take a look at the staff we have and how we can possibly spread out these roles amongst existing staff. And I would even um, encourage us not to replace Raul Ramirez um, with the, an assistant superintendent role. You know, that's basically around a quarter of a million dollars a year when in fact, you know, we do have Sarah, is it Lawfridge, Sierra Lawfridge, who's already the director of elementary education. So I think that it's really an opportunity now that we're in this very bizarre pause to take a look at staffing, sort of, you know, pull down um, where we can um, from, from a lot of sort of top heavy, very expensive admin staff and see where we can spread those duties around to existing staff. I just think that any person would do that. Any good, competent business person would do that. And I think that you have a duty to do that rather than fund these things right now. Thank you, Ms. Rosenberg. Thank you. And that concludes our public comment. Thank you, Ms. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hugh. So now to the board, are there any items in the consent agenda that we, we would like to pull? If you can, yes, Ms. Ford. I'm not sure if I want to pull it. I do want to ask a couple questions about E1, the CHAMPS program. Well, that, that takes pulling it. So that's all you need, which is fine. Uh, let's, let's take up E1, uh, since there's just one item. Uh, let's see who that would be. Dr. Ramirez. Dr. Ramirez, Ms. Ford, why don't you ask your question? Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Ramirez, I apologize ahead of time if I missed something I should have read before, but I feel like this is the first time that I saw this. If it, it's not, please remind me. But I'm mostly interested in um, what, you are, what your goals are for this one day workshop. It sounds like it's one day. And also, what teachers will attend and um, and what other programs or how did you reach the decision to go with CHAMPS? Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Ford. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, a couple of different things. Um, number one, uh, this is a part of a, a bigger conversation having to do with uh, Cleveland status as um, a CSI school um, and what that means is that they will require comprehensive support from us as a district. So uh, for the better part of a year, we've been focusing very intently on Cleveland, uh, having to do with um, everything that is displayed in the California dashboard. Uh, right before, uh, in the months leading up to the, the shutdown of our schools due to pandemic, we actually brought a team of district uh, personnel to meet with site personnel, school school um, teachers, site administrator, and so on, uh, to talk about all of all of their data for the last year. We talked about uh, their goals, their their attempts um, to 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 build up their instructional program, and to really focus on things having to do with the broader school culture. Um, they have partnered with the Ventura County Office of Ed now for the better part of a year. Um, and they saw CHAMPS as a, through Safe and Civil Schools as an opportunity to build up their positive behavior and intervention support layer. Uh, they felt like this was um, a way to formalize that, uh, that opportunity because prior to that, they had received probably somewhere in the neighborhood of nine people had received about six hours worth of um, formalized training. And they felt that, they, that it wasn't enough that they needed to have something more concrete, a longer range plan, and something to really help them when it came to how to develop the best types of procedures and protocols at their school to be able to build out uh, more positive uh, relationships and therefore a more positive school culture. So um, this is something that's been in the works for several months. 
we, we, we intended to bring this forward as part of our SPSA, um, SPSA round robin, right, that we, that we have every year. Unfortunately, because the CSI plan, the Comprehensive Support Plan, is embedded into that for Cleveland, uh, but unfortunately, we were not able to, um, and that would have happened um, about two weeks ago now. So that is something that you will see represented there. We have additional funds coming to us from, um, from the federal government uh, by way of the state to help in this endeavor. And uh, we feel like this is a, a good way to bring forward. To your question about who would participate, that is going to be during the staff phase day. Um, so the staff is aware, their leadership, their school leadership team is on board. We heard that from them um, as a need over the course of a year. And they are, they are really thirsting for something that is comprehensive and that is helpful. Because it's Ventura County Office of Ed, we also needed to involve and outreach to the Santa Barbara um, County Education Office. So they too are on board with that as well. Thanks. Um, specifically, are they looking to uh, manage behavior in class better? In hopes they're, they're, that has a direct impact on achievement? Uh, yeah, so they're looking to build, first and foremost, positive relationships. And a component of that is um, how you uh, establish uh, positive expectations uh, for unstructured settings, for classrooms, for um, activities within classrooms. And so they've already launched that, uh, but, they, but they did it in a way that they felt was too... Um, was promising and helpful, but that they needed more intensive support in order to get better results. Um, so this is a commitment that they already made this year and they felt very positive about it, uh, but they felt like they needed something more formalized because not the, the entire staff wasn't able to take part in it. And uh, this would include classified staff as well. Um, so there are components there in that plan that would bridge the entire school community and then um, also add a, a parent communication component through the consultant through the consultancy with BCOE. But it's intended to be really the staff getting all on board. And this is, uh, part of it is materials that we need to procure. And part of it is going to be the partnership specifically with BCOE. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Dr. Maris. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ford. Any other questions? Or any other, oh, Ms. sims Mountain, you're muted. Uh, yes, I was looking for uh, E7 with regards to the E uh, rate contract. Can either Ms. Jate or, let's see who else is on the staff on that. Mr. Rickman, can you explain, is that a new contract or is that something that's been existing and we're just amending forward? I didn't put that one on. I, ha I have to look at it. What what company is it for? Um, let me pull it up. It is for um, the contract for E-rate compliance services, which is, uh, I guess we would be consult uh, contracting with CSM Consulting Incorporated. So is that you, Mr. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I can answer. Oh, okay. Um, that's, a, that's a company that we've used for a long time to help us with uh, E-rate compliance. Uh, it's just renewing the contract with them. So... And what do you mean by E-rate compliance? I Meaning, is that our uh, electronics? What, what does the E stand for? I guess it's trying to figure that out. Oh, so, so E-rate is a federal program that provides money to schools uh, for a variety of things having to do with uh, generally around communications, digital communications. Um, and most school districts hire a consultant because it's, it's very... Um, there's a lot of federal guidelines that, that if you make a mistake, you're out the money. Uh, and so we have used this consultant for a long time. They're one of the biggest uh, in the state, uh, and, and we've always had good luck uh, with them. But most districts hire E-rate consultants because of, like I said, how difficult uh, all the regulations are to uh, get through. And one, thank you for that. And one, one last question would be, so their rate is about 29000 annually. So are we able to recover that when we bring funds down? Are we upfronting that cost of that? consultant or how does that work? 
Uh, well, that consultant, I, that's a question for Meg. I'm not sure, but I, I can tell you that consultants helps us secure uh, well in excess of a million dollars uh, uh, every year. Okay. It also decreases our payment to other vendors that are involved in that side of the budget. So it, it, it comes in as a credit on a lot of bill, different kinds of bills. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. I just wasn't, I wasn't sure what that what that was in terms of the E-rate part. So thank you so much. Excellent, okay. Uh, thanks for that clarification. Any other items to be pulled or um, for questions or a vote? Seeing none, I need a motion please to approve the consent agenda. Ms. Ford. I move to approve the consent agenda for today. Thank you. Dr. Reed. Second. Thank you for seconding. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for the clarifications. We are moving on to the action agenda, which is the approval of action uh, F1 is the approval of the employment agreement for the superintendent. So just for clarifications purposes, in, as per the Brown Act, in closed session, we approve the appointment and of the, the choice of superintendent. And now uh, in open session, we need to move upon the contract, which can be made available once we approve it, if we do approve it, <laughs> to the public. It is a public document. Um, and so with that, uh, we need a motion to approve the employment agreement for the next superintendent, Hilda Maldonado. So moved. Uh, I'm sorry, I neglected, thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. Uh, we have our council. I need to, to clarify important components of that, of that contract. First is the salary, which is $250,000. Second is the three-year term uh, of the contract. Third is um, a 10,000 annual contribution to a 401k. Fourth is um, a $500 expense, car expense per month. So those are the components, again, need to be expressed publicly and again, uh, made public um, upon approval this evening. So thank you for that motion, Ms. Sims Moten. And now I need a second. Second. I saw Ms. Munoz second, uh, so thanks. Ms. Munoz is a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thanks, everybody. Now moving on to item F2, I believe, um, and that is the adoption of the resolution of the school year, 20, I'm sorry, 2019-26, declaring this the week of May 18th to the 22nd as Classified School Employee Week in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Dr. Becchio. Thank you and good evening, board. It's um, a pleasure to bring this item before you. I wanna first start by thanking um, Paul Rooney and his leadership team for, for um, uh, getting this resolution to me so we could get it before you. I do wanna highlight, um, before I turn it over to you for a vote, I wanted to highlight the actual resolution and, and really the first line where it um, states that classified professionals provide valuable services to the schools and students. Um, the word valuable, I just wanted to expand upon that just, to, just for a second. Um, and our classified um, employees, um, if you look in the contract under Appendix A, there's about 17 job families in Appendix A. Um, there's over probably around 150 different job titles and there's roughly, I would say, 700 classified employees. So um, when you think about the exchange that happens between teacher and student in the classroom, um, that, that really is not possible without um, the valuable service that is, takes place across all those job families and all those positions. So I wanted to just point that out that it's... Um, it's valuable, but it's valuable across a, such a diverse um, list of jobs uh, in our district. And so um, recognizing that, I wanted to, um, to just uh, turn this over to you to, I know you've had a chance to read it, but also um, approve it and, and go into the record as, um, as a proclamation. Thank you, Dr. Becchio, for that 
as well. Do any uh, board members want to make comments or questions on the resolution? Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you so much. I really was glad to see this come forward to us. You know, uh, those of us in education know that there are lots of jokes out there about the school secretary being the one who actually runs the school. But in so many ways, it's kind of close to being very real. And for me, the truth is that schools couldn't run smoothly and students and staff and teachers just could not get what they need without the classified staff. And that is no joke. So in my career, it's been the administrative staff, the paraprofessionals, and the custodians who are always there whenever I needed them. And I am certain that that's the truth here in Santa Barbara Unified. You will not find a more loyal, hardworking, essential group than our classified staff. And this recognition makes it official. Excellent. And I wanted to, uh, I'm sorry, are there, do I see other hands up? I just want to acknowledge our food service workers. We are now uh, serving dinner um, and three meals a day and in so many locations and working on expanding for summer. So these are classified employees that are working hard right now to feed our families in need. And it's so important given all the layoffs that are happening culturally and, and in this community. Um, so thank you to our food service workers, to our classified workers and all of our classified workers. Anybody else? Okay, with that, uh, oh, Ms. Munoz. Yeah, I just wanted to recognize, you know, their efforts and their role in our schools, you know, through the years with my daughters growing up, the classified employees and were the ones that I relied on for support that I know that my daughters went to, that I went to, you know, um, and, and such for so many years and, um, and then also, you know, now every day, and here we are um, with their support and all of their efforts and interest in our students. They see our students um, go through school, they see the next generation, and they, you know, um, are just um, our eyes and ears out there. So I just really appreciate all of their hard work um, every day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. With that, I need a motion. I, I'll make the motion to approve the resolution declaring the week of May 18th through the 22nd as classified school employee week in our district. Second. All right, Ms. Ford with the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Becchio. Next up again, Dr. Becchio, if you could speak to the compensation agreement between non-representative classified and certificated management and confidential employees in our district. I, I can. Um, do you want me to go to uh, do F3 first? Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped. I skipped. Uh, All right. I'll do it in whichever order. We'll, we'll stick to the right order. We'll go back okay. to F3, which is the approval of the classified management job description, food service site manager. Okay. Well, thank right. you. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, last uh, board meeting, um, the board approved two uh, food service manager positions. And um, so we went, went to the drawing board and, and got a job description completed and, and sent it over to you. And it's now on the, as part of the agenda. Um, really what the focus of these two management positions is, is, is um, well, if you think of employee management as an umbrella, there is um, there's actually a lot underneath that umbrella um, to, to properly manage employees. And, um, you know, the concern we had was the number of food service classified employees that were being managed or supervised, if you will, by one, one um, administrative position. And so the focus of this position will be on the overall management, proper management of employees in the kitchens. That'll consist of coaching and training um, some actually real important safety training, um, observing and giving performance feedback. Um, also the evaluation of course of those employees is important. And um, just the overall general communication that is needed between the supervisor and the employee. And so uh, this position will add to leaving us with three management positions that will be able to do that employee management work. 
And so with that, I'm happy to um, answer any questions. I'm not sure if Matt Dittman is here with us tonight, but um, I'll, I'll try to tackle whatever questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Riccio. Any questions from the board? No, we spent a fair amount of time on this not too long ago. Uh, yeah, Ms. Simpson. Yeah, I, I just, well, yeah, absolutely spent the, the amount of time and, and conversation needed on this. And I just want to acknowledge the work um, that the cabinet did, our team did to bring this to us, because I think it's really important. I'm hoping this is the first step in the phase of, you know, uh, shoring up this, the structural uh, deficits that happen just because we've not had a structure that has allowed us to really evaluate and really um, effectively use the umbrella in terms of allowing folks to to have direct and evaluation, you know, coming back to them and, and change the direction we need it. Because I think, um, as I thought about our last conversation, uh, we have such a passion for feeding folks, and that's absolutely where we should be. So, but I think it's really important we to not we need to balance that passion with good sound structure, both structurally and fiscally to make sure that we are sustainable in the future. So we're not coming back wondering, you know, or trying to fix something in the end. So I, I, I encourage us to continue to look at this where it can be self-sustaining because we've balanced our passion as well as not getting ahead of our business sense with, with regards to that. So thank you for bringing this. I think this is the first step, a much, a much needed first step in with regards to strengthening the structure um, of our food service um, division. So thank you very much. Good point. Thank you, Ms. sims -Wilton. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we need a motion. So moved. Uh, Ms. sims with the motion and Ms. Ford with the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you so much, Dr. Becky. Now on to the next one, which is the, as I already introduced, the compensation agreement, item F4. Correct. Okay, thank you. And um, this item, we, we do have two groups of employees in our organization that are not represented by bargaining units. Um, we have, uh, I have brought to you the um, SBTA tentative agreement and also the CSEA tentative agreement on the last board agenda. And um, bringing to you tonight the um, Me Too um, compensation agreement for the two, represent, two employee groups that are not represented. So that is the confidential employees and the management employees. And I did highlight that this excludes, this includes everyone in management, but excludes the superintendent. Um, and so that is um, the proposal that's before you. The Me Too um, is simply a, um, a matching of the 2% the that was approved for both SBTA and CSEA employees. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Becchio. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, we need a motion here. Dr. Reed. So moved. Thank you. Second. Ms. sims Moton with the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, good. We will move on to item F5 the approval of the Adelante facility MOU. And I say that as the board representative to Adelante. So thank you, Mr. Matsuoka. I know how much time and effort has gone into this next one. Yes, Ms. Caps and board, uh, we started working on this almost two years ago. It felt like when Adelante expressed their needs for more space and um, yes, they are really crammed into a very small space. I think it's, uh, Gosh, is it about an acre? It's, it's just really compact. So uh, through a lot of uh, creative thinking, um, you have board the before and after plan. Uh, it really involves um, relocating the uh, preschool location that's currently Franklin Children's Center to the property at, oh, the name's escaping me. Help, help. At the Parma site, uh, which is currently unused. Parma. So uh, we wanted to document for our board and for the Adelante board, these commitments to the future. It's gonna take a couple years to play this out, but we wanted uh, both boards to have this approved before my retirement so that there's a corporate memory embedded in approved documents. So be glad to answer any questions. 
Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Matsuoka. And I can just attest that I walked uh, the, the premises of this new vision uh, long ago, uh, one evening with, with Mr. Matsuoka, and it makes a ton of sense <laughs> um, and would mean so much more space for a school that has a long, long waiting list, right? <laughs> and a lot of demand in this art community to have a bilingual, um, biliterate education, so, and they need more space. So this is a great plan, and I appreciate the work to try to get this in place uh, before your time is up with us. And any questions from the board or any comments? Dr. Reed. I just wanted to reiterate that um, because when this came forward, uh, it, it took a lot of negotiation and it took a lot of process and time and people willing to step back and rethink and reframe and then come forward. And so seeing this plan uh, it come to fruition was a lot of hard work, but a lot of collaboration. And I wanted to acknowledge um, Adelante and the work that they brought forward and Mr. Matsuoka and his um, vision as well to, uh, to make this happen. And it's exciting because it's, it's where we need to go and where we need to move forward and to be able to provide this space for our students is gonna be, um, it's, it's going to be great. I, I have a teacher that was a student teacher with me last year that was working at Adelante and he just said, gosh, when are you guys going to fix this? <laughs> when, when are you going to take this problem and make it better? Because it's, it's tight. So anyway, um, I think to all that were involved, I appreciate the work and it's exciting where we're moving forward for our families and administrators, but certainly for our students. Ms. Munoz. Yes, I toured the um, Adelante School last year and also went to their graduation. And it's, yeah, it's, I appreciate all the work that went into it, um, Mr. Matsioko, and everyone's collaboration. And it's, it is, it's, it's overdue <laughs> for this to happen. Very excited. Um, thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you. Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, I too just want to echo the, the comments of my. Uh, fellow, fellow sister, let me take that fellow out, sister board members uh, uh, with regards to this. And I certainly appreciate um, the, the preschool and expanding that and making that, you know, a really uh, big priority with regards to that. So that really speaks to me uh, in terms of making sure that our uh, early, early learning, it has a, has a priority in this district. So thank you very much, Mr. Matsuoka, for seeing it through. And as we gives us a good gateway to going, as you're exiting out, it still gives us a gateway as we continue forward. So thank you so much. Excellent. Okay, good. Well, I think that we're prepared to move this forward. I move uh, to approve, let's let me get the correct uh, language, the approve the Adelante facility MOU. Second. Ms. Uh, Dr. Ms. Reed, okay. Uh, Dr. Reed with the second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Motion passes. Thank you so much, everybody. We're moving right along here, and we move now to item F6, which is the approval of the link learning proposal. Mr. Matsuoka. Yes, board. Uh, I apologize that there isn't a, a slide deck to help frame our comments. So um, I just I wrote down some notes to help walk us through this. Um, March 13th was that the day we closed our physical schools and went online. Um, so the the changes that have been asked of our teachers for the last, gosh, I think my report tonight, this is now week nine of online learning. And we know that our teachers need support and, that, and that's the right word, support for how do you teach students in an online environment. and as we wrestle with, is it gonna be scenario one, continuing distance learning, or hopefully scenario two, where we get to do a hybrid shared brick and mortar school day with time at home. We're going to be in some type of online learning environment, um, I think at least till December 2020. Uh, that's just my personal guess, but based on the, the, the positive uh, happenings with social distancing and, and reopening society. 
but also the reality is that we're going to have to social distance for a season. So we really want to provide some support and training for our teachers and how do you teach in an online environment when the students aren't physically with you, when you can't communicate as quickly and easily. So that's the need. Um, what Link Learning is an organization that's really specialized in how do you train teachers uh, in independent learning, personalized learning. Um, the, the words we like to use is how do you create student agency and ownership of learning? And they really are national experts in this space. The, the, the item that really stood out to me when I started getting to know them quickly is they have built a learning environment for the adults that we aspire to develop for our students, meaning that there's more independent learning. Um, it's personalized learning. Um, you can do it at your own pace, that it's not, here's this word, event-driven professional development. And what that means to us is event-driven is we schedule a day and we bring all our teachers together and we train them in person on a single day. Um, if you think about it, our classrooms are daily events under normal circumstances. But now we're forced to do this online where we have just a lot less contact and control of students. And so what this is gonna be an experience for our adults is how do you learn in an online environment at your own pace? Um, they will be given an assessment. They will be asked questions to assess where they are. If they, only, if they already understand blended learning, then they can move on to the modules that would be of benefit. Uh, it, it's always been my dream to teach about personalized learning using personalized learning tools. Um, I have to admit, I tended to resort to, okay, let's all get together, and here's my PowerPoint slide deck, and we go through it. Um, so the fact that they have been working on this for four years and their entire company is modeled around how to deliver online PD, I think they're well positioned to help us out. The, the case study that's very recent for them uh, they got the contract to train Boston Public Schools right when the pandemic started. And I wrote, included the statistics, which are really stunning, that they achieved 25,000 hours of professional development of 5,000 teachers in Boston in four weeks. I mean, just kind of wrap your head around that, 25,000 hours. Um, that, that's, that's delivering services using the power of technology. Um, and then I'll, I'll just comment, I, I don't mean to scare people, but here's, here's the issue of time. We have six more days in the school year. Just realize that we have six more days and our teachers are going to go into their summer, but we need to communicate what is, you know, the framework of our plan for next year. And, and a big request that we've heard from SBTA leaders is our teachers need support. They need training. Um, we are 11 weeks away from opening school next year. And so, and, and it's gonna be a year like no other. Um, yes, this year was crazy because it got disrupted in March, but next year we're across the country gonna open school in a very different environment. So I did share in the, the comments that SBTA was at the table as we reviewed and learned uh, from Link Learning. Um, they were supportive. And, and we're gonna to need to work collaboratively with them as we design models and train our staff. So I'll, I'll pause there and be glad to respond to any questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Matsuoka. Any questions or comments? Well, I just agree. Oh, yeah, Ms. Simpson. I'm sorry, I just have a quick comment. I just wanna appreciate, you know, um, the support that the teachers need and that we're taking those steps to, to do so. So they get the support that they need and that's a mental, you know, um, a, a mental break from wondering how are we gonna do this because everything is coming so fast. And if this allows them to have, you know, a little bit more focused time on how they're gonna do it, be able to express themselves, you know, through that. And I, and I would hope that not just learning how to do it, but how to also deal with it, what's the mental aspects of doing that as well is part of this program. I'll add that uh, a big core value for Link Learning is that they work on culture, um, the culture of learning, the culture of classrooms. So 
uh, that came in through in our conversations with their staff. So um, it is less about the, the technical day-to-day, -day, like how to use Google Classroom, you know, how, how to use online learning apps. It's more about how do you set up a, a classroom it, on Zoom? How do you interact with like students through this? Look at, look at us. We see each other in these little boxes. And uh, man, that's a different teaching environment. So to offer support will be really helpful. Dr. Reed. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge um, as well that providing support is so necessary and it's not just about, you know, breakout rooms. There's more creativity and then the Zoom fatigue and, and then just how do you step out of the box and really, really rethink how to do this. So bringing all of the teachers together to brainstorm as well about be a part of that process as opposed to suddenly you're, you're, this is what you're doing. Now they can be a part of this process of developing this and working towards um, this online, you know, learning process. So I think it sounds like a great idea and it probably will lend itself to even more um, progressive learning opportunities. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Oh, thank you. Mr. Matsuoka, I wonder if you could just give a little bit more detail about the process. I mean, it looks like you guys were talking negotiations and then you paused and had some sort of a Zoom workshop about the, the Link PD. And so I'd love for you to explain a little bit more about how the decision was made and who made the decision. Sure, great question. Uh, we had scheduled our first negotiation session on Monday. Uh, I forget, we could go Monday. And my first introduction to the Link Learning team was the Friday before. And as I listened to them, I, I thought, wow, they could be really helpful for our teachers. And so I made a bunch of phone calls that Friday afternoon to half were to SBTA negotiation team leaders, half to our cabinet. And just, I said, okay, I realize I'm just the one person who heard this, but I think they could be really helpful to us. So we actually postponed the discussion about learning models for next year. And I asked the team, uh, can we please just introduce uh, Jason Green, CEO in Link Learning? So I did take that first Monday and say, hey, I want you to, I want to introduce you to this group. And I, again, I, I stood back and watched to just watch, you know, the listening and the learning. And, and there was really good agreement that Link Learning could be helpful to us. Um, I felt it very important to bring SBTA in at almost, I call it the ground level because you know, if I had made the decision or cabinet had made the decision and then, then tomorrow we go to SBTA negotiations. Oh, by the way, we hired this company and they had no, just no background. Um, it, it just it makes it harder to get things in place. So, so that was the reason for the, the quick decisions. My other time pressure is we had a board meeting tonight. Our next board meeting would not have been until June 9th and then June 23rd. And if we're gonna try and build out a PD plan over the next couple of weeks to help us with June training of leaders, and then tomorrow we wanna to talk with SBTA, SBTA leadership about how should we roll this out to all teachers. So it's, it's also a time crunch. We just needed, if we were gonna get them under contract, it really should be tonight, because by June 9th, our teachers are out of contract. You know, we're moving into some So this sounds like you could say with full confidence that Karen McBride is behind this decision. Yes. That's great. Thank you. I know, I know Karen's probably listening. Um, I, I, I think I, I'm speaking for her um, accurately because she expressed her support in our meeting. Um, and I think she also followed up with some communication. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Munoz. Yes, that's, that's what I was going to also um, ask about is uh, about Karen McBride and the um, SBTA agreement to it for good communication and transparency. 
Yeah, we're, we're doing our best. I mean, we're, we're meeting once a week. The problems seem to arise in about 48 hour cycles. Um, but um, that's why we wanted to get them in on the ground level. So uh, uh, I will speak that SBTA is in really good support. They still have some questions about implementation, um, but they express support at the meeting. And I also offer to them, if you guys huddle separate from us and you have concerns, let me know as I put together this board agenda. Um, and I, I got a, a little bit of positive communication from Karen in between. So I would say SBTA is ready to partner with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to add uh, my two cents. I, I, you know, this is just one small piece of a, a plan that will be unfolding. And I think that's important. I know on a regular basis, I'm asked what's going to happen. How are kids going to come back? Are we fully in school? Are we not? And I think that, so when I had the chance to speak with Mr. Matsuoka about this uh, last week, question, you know, how does this fit into the rest of it? And the truth is, we know that regardless of what happened, we know right now, we don't know a lot of things, but we know right now that online learning is going to be a much bigger component of our education system as it should be. Um, and so this, I believe, speaks to that need. And so I just wanted to give that context that this is just a, a small, small piece of an unfolding plan that is changing as we learn more every day about this virus and, and the impacts it has on the, the learning in the future. Ms. Ford. I totally agree. And I, I'm very excited to know that the teachers are behind this. I also think it, it just like lots of things with this pandemic, if you can look on the bright side, uh, as Mr. Rickman has discussed and many other members of the cabinet, this has propelled us into the future. And for me, uh, we all know that sit and get types of professional development are very limited in their effectiveness. And to think this is per, uh, personalized and individualized, it has so much potential. Hey, uh, board, let me, sorry to interrupt. Um, uh, Ms. Trujillo, can you send Karen McBride the Zoom link to the, um, this side of the seminar? And uh, she would like to offer her comments directly to the board, okay? I will move her to the panelists. Yep. Um, can I just add something while we are waiting for Ms. McBride to come on? I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Oh, oh go ahead, Karen. Uh, go ahead, Wendy, if you'd like to speak. I was just going to add to the, I was on a webinar, an ed, uh, educational webinar, and they talked about how uh, educators really want to change it, the way we deliver education. And, and, and so what, it, what is this, even in the midst of this just frustration and, and all the differences and everything that we're going through, this is an opportunity as well to really, you know, uh, take full advantage of how we really want to do and teach in the, in the 21st century. And so as much as it is, we still don't know, but at the same time, there's this huge opportunity for the things we know that work, that how can we use this opportunity to move that agenda forward so that we're getting, as we're moving into the 21st century, we're moving at a pace or at a pace and or at, at a, at a, at a framework of what we want to see 21st looking like and it, pushing us out. So this may have pushed us into there somewhere we've always wanted to be. So uh, I was very struck by that by that um, comment by, from one of the leaders who talked about, yes, we were moving in here uh, into a, a place that we didn't expect to go. We want to be here, but the fact that this COVID-19 has pushed us there, we need to really take full advantage of this opportunity to do so. Uh, well, that's a, a great segue for me, Wendy, because, um, yeah, this is a, a um, you know, it's one of the silver linings, I think, to, to the circumstances behind COVID-19. Um, and there have been a lot of teachers, I've watched the progression, I've listened to them in Zoom meetings, and I've watched them start out, you know, on the ceiling, because they've been so stressed out. And as as the the weeks and months have passed, it's crazy to say months, but um, they've come down from the ceiling and they are feeling better about um, the fact that the tools they've been introduced to, I mean, this has been especially tough, I'm not gonna lie, on, on teachers who are TK through two, because of the, the fact that their kids weren't using um, 
distance learning or I'm sorry, weren't using iPads on a regular basis and therefore the teachers didn't have the tools, weren't familiar with them. And so it was just a massive effort to get everybody tuned in. Now that we're 10 weeks out, they're feeling more comfortable and saying, yeah, I want to learn more about this. I want to get, I want to get more, uh, more well-versed. It's tempered with the fact that people are completely fried and they're ready for a break. So, uh, you know, if you suggest PD to a teacher right now, they're not going to be overwhelmed and overjoyed. Um, but, uh, and, and so SBTA is cautiously optimistic. We, um, of course, recognize the district's role in providing professional development and the decision to provide it um, in this manner is really, in the, in the long run, it is up to the district and we recognize that. But I, I think that it's really great that um, this is a model that can be personalized and it can be adapted over time even after we um, move out of this this phase and can get back to our classrooms. I hope that this is a tool that will be useful for a long time to come. And and personally, um, I, I think everybody on this call can relate to meetings where you've gone and you've had expectations and the meetings or the trainings just didn't meet your expectation. So um, I'll say one more thing and then I'll and then I'll stop. We um, as a team reached out to Link Spring after our meeting with Carrie and the, the rest of the design team and we got um, access to uh, demonstration accounts and we poked around and, and looked at the resources. I think everybody's sort of taken their own personal uh, tack on the on the um, resources that are available and we are cautiously optimistic that it could be a really good thing. So um, I just, uh, the one thing I ask for is grace because the teachers are going to be needing a break. I shouldn't say just teachers, all of, all of the um, certificated staff are gonna be needing a break. And uh, one more thing is I, I think that um, we wanna be careful and make sure that the needs of all of our staff our, our certificated members are met. So, you know, we have nurses and speech and language pathologists and school psychologists, et cetera, who, who really want to make sure that um, this is a tool that's going to meet their needs as well. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to this. I really appreciate it. There's another uh, benefit of the link learning platform is we can use it to train our paraeducators. Uh, which we've always had challenges with how do we get them training and so many of the modules uh, that will support good teaching will be really relevant for our paraeducator layers so we look forward to offering that training to them as well thank you so much thanks mr bride for being on the phone on the zoom here uh, any other comments or questions about this it seems like we are ready for a motion Ms. Ford. Thanks, I'd like to move to approve the uh, implementation and purchase of LINK Learning. Excellent, and Ms. sims Milton with the second. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Aye, motion carries, thanks to everyone. Uh, okay, great, um, now we're moving on to the last action agenda item, which is item seven, the approval of the long-term lease agreements for Caesar, senior housing development on district-owned Vacant Tatum, we are at the end of the line here after a multi-year conversation about this property, uh, including a good report last week, last meeting by Mr. Price and Mr. Matsuoka. So Mr. Matsuoka. So I double checked with Craig. It's been 16 years of a process <laughs> that honestly, Mr. Price has been the through line through, wow, three or four superintendents, countless school board members. Um, his attention to this project um, should be commended. So the uh, final set of documents are there for you to approve. They are essentially, they're practically identical to what the board received last board meeting. And so I present this to you, school board, to approve the long-term lease agreements for the housing development at the Tatum property. 
Excellent. Any questions or comments that haven't been asked? I'm not, I'm, I don't mean to say that to dissuade any of them. <laughs> I just want to say yay. <laughs> I know. It's good. 16 years in the making. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Senior housing and other, other housing in Goleta. It's excellent. Great. Okay. Uh, who would like to make this motion? Make a motion. Dr. Reed, we'll make the motion. Yes. I make the motion to approve the long-term lease agreements for senior housing development on district-owned vacant Tatum site. Excellent. And I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks to all involved. Mr. Price, Mr. Matsuoka, Mr. Vizzolini, so many people. Thank you so much. And with that, we are going to take it's a short break in between action agenda. So it's 8.07 by my computer's clock. We will come back at, let's do, uh, let's make it pretty short, 8.15. Is that okay? Yep. A little bio break. 8.15. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. I believe we are all back after that short break. And so now we will move to item G1. I'm going to first turn it over to Mr. Matsuoka, just um, item G1. Yes, uh, school board, you already know the news um, and our, our entire district staff knows the news. But before we enter into the annual DLAC report, um, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the, the deep, long six year work of Dr. Raul Ramirez. Um, we all know that he uh, has secured his next position as superintendent of the Mesa Union School District in Ventura County. And uh, he is going to enjoy a much shorter commute, um, which I can see the smile already. Um, you know, he and I have been conversing about his, you know, career path and next steps for, gosh, really my four years here. Uh, I am so pleased uh, for him. I think this is gonna be a tremendous opportunity uh, for him to bring everything that he's learned uh, with us and for us, um, but now to take care of uh, a district of 800 kids, um, he, he just gets to really dive down back back on the ground and, and work with teachers and be in direct contact with students. So board, I just wanted to take this moment to publicly acknowledge uh, Dr. Ramirez's service to us. Um, I, I think you have a sense of what he's done for us, but I gotta tell you, the the behind the scenes work that he's done for our English language learners, um, for our reclassification program, um, the language translation unit team, um, and then all of the, the stuff that's just really hard work like FPM and compliance. I mean, he, he has gotten us out of so much trouble board um, and uh, we, we need to find somebody who's gonna plug those holes for us but uh, Dr. Ramirez, I just wanted to, I wish we were in the boardroom right now. I really do. Um, just to look you in the eyes and just thank you for your service uh, to celebrate you and wish you, you're not gonna need good luck. Your future district is so fortunate to have you as their, their next leader. So wanted to offer those comments and, and board, um, I, I invite you to just share some appreciations of Dr. Ramirez right now. Dr. Reed. I just want to echo uh, Mr. Matsuoka's praise and just congratulate uh, Dr. Ramirez on this transition to a new career path for, for him. And um, I know that you have been instrumental in providing leadership to ensure student achievement and equitable outcomes for students. Mm -hmm. And you've done a tremendous um, work to move the needle for our emerging multilingual students and um and just for providing leadership in this important area so i i too think you will you don't need good luck um <laughs> but i will say that you will be missed and um but both you and your work won't be forgotten and i want to wish you all the success in this future endeavor thank you yeah, Ms. Munoz. 
Okay, as I shared with you one-on-one, um, -on -one, you know, for years I've been to the school board meetings as a community member. Um, and I, you know, noticed your ex expertise, your dedication to our students, and then to, you know, come on um, <clears throat> the school board and have that experience of, you know, collaborating, learning uh, from you, and just the partnership with, you know, the multilingual um, pathways uh, most recently, but also so many different projects that you have dedicated yourself to and making sure that the school district is in compliance and such. I know that um, Mesa Union School District is in good hands with you, will be in good hands with you at the helm um, and wish you the very best. And also, you know, just, it's been an honor. It's been a pleasure to, to work with you. Yeah, Dr. Ramirez, I just wish you all the best in your new endeavor and, and just know how wonderful it will be for you to be a little closer to family, certainly during this challenging time, uh, but wish you all the best and thank you for your hard work. Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you. Also, I wish you the best and um, Dr. Ramirez, I know I have sometimes been a thorn in your side and uh, I just feel so strongly that Mesa Union is going to benefit from all of your knowledge and your experience. I also want to thank you, and especially because every time that I had a concern, every time that I had a question, you always answered really promptly and very completely. So thank you. Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, so I echo the comments of my sister board members and I just want to add my certainly wishing you well and have enjoyed getting to know who you are um, in more in depth. And I really want to, and I want to express that I know Mesa is getting a, a good person who is committed to uh, student achievement and success. And then lastly, I just want to add that as we work together over these three years in terms of that, that really raising and uh, elevating others uh, in terms of moving others out, but really identifying folks so that they can see who they are, no matter how small a percentage they are in the district. So I think that's really important and something that we need to continue to do and hope that you've left some pathway, how we continue to work on that so that we elevate out of the other, but to actually recognizing our, our students, no matter their percentage. So thank you. And I definitely wish you well. Well, I certainly want to thank uh, the entire board, uh, Carrie, my teammates, uh, everybody really for the outpouring of, of support that I've had in the last week. I'm very blessed uh, to have been a part of your journey. I've benefited greatly. I hope that I've left uh, some somewhat of a mark and it's in some ways very fitting that this that I get an opportunity to uh, just provide some brief comments for this particular uh, topic. Um, it's because of parents um, in this district uh, that I found my way to it. They, they advocated for a role that was very needed, a role that was very necessary, <clears throat> and one that um, needed to exist for us to uh, bring the right level of attention um, and, the, and to bring attention to the fact that, that our kids are a shared responsibility. They don't reside in any one office. They don't reside in any one leader. Uh, they are all of ours to, to, take, to take forward into the world. And it's very unusual that a position that has had three people in it inside of six years would actually benefit um, those of you who are leaders, uh, Ms. Ford, uh, you might know this well, but instability is, is not, does not make for good and positive change. Um, so it's at this, at this time that um, I also wanna, wanna hearken the, the efforts and the diligence of Dr. Mora of Maria Larios Horton, who we're incredibly fortunate to have. And the only thing that I can say is um, they built upon uh, a starting point. And I'm very, I've learned so much from them, but I'm incredibly proud. And I think it's been largely due to the fact that our core values are so in sync and our trust is so great in one another that we were able to uh, put forward what I believe is a good quality service to the community. Um, one other thing, when I when I got to the to the, to the district, um, there were two fundamental questions that I asked, and it was just my my only way of defining a starting point. 
what is your reclassification policy? And how do you support parents? And I felt like the answers that I received to both of those uh, weren't satisfactory. They weren't up to the level uh, that we could otherwise have. And so I made it my mission to go ahead and move forward with whatever I could bring and then um, work behind the scenes. You know, I've never been somebody that leads uh, anywhere from, but from, from behind, because it's been my, my greatest pleasure to see others grow and build their arsenal as leaders. Um, and so this will be a new role for me. I will be more, much more prominent in it. I can guarantee you I will do my best just as I've done in this role. And there will probably be elements of me that will develop in that role that, um, I, I, that I've polished here and that I will continue to polish into the future. Uh, last comment. I want to congratulate the board on the hiring of Ms. Hilda Maldonado. Um, just from what I've seen, I think she's going to be a fantastic leader. Um, I urge you to support her, and I, er, and I know our leadership team will absolutely do so, and our community is ready to 100% to back her. So I'm very happy for you to have found somebody who, who is such a fit for the times. Uh, with that, um, I wanted to just offer up some, some, some preliminary thoughts uh, and then turn it over to Maria. Uh, our DLAC has been incredible, as I mentioned before. Um, my first DLAC meeting in the district consisted of an outside group facilitating our meeting. And I, I looked around and I said, tell me how we involve ourselves with uh, supporting our parent leaders. And there again, I, met, I was met with some incomplete answers. Fast forward now six years later, it is a leadership team unto itself. And these, these families have built on one another, have built community, and they've unlocked their own agency. We didn't give it to them, they always had it. And we have been able to harness uh, their talents and help them find their own voice and, ex and, and declare it to the community. And I feel like uh, I couldn't be prouder that we're gonna be bringing forward parent leaders and that Maria will have an opportunity to um, just tell you about the process that brought us to tonight. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Maria uh, for the rest of the presentation. And thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Ms. Larios Horton, take it away. Thank you. Gracias, Dr. Ramirez, y gracias por ser un líder ejemplar para nuestra comunidad. Um, buenas tardes, Presidenta Caps, miembros del Consejo de Educación, Superintendente Matsuoka y comunidad. Por mi parte, les felicito por su selección de, la superintendente, de nuestra Superintendente Maldonado. Estoy encantada y ansiosa eh, por trabajar con ella. Muchas gracias. Me gustaría recordarles uh, que el reporte de hoy viene acompañado de un informe completo, tanto como diapositivas en inglés, los cuales ya han sido compartidos con ustedes de antemano. Para este reporte y para la facilidad del comité, compartiré mi pantalla con las diapositivas en español. Si me permite Sandra o, o Todd eh, compartir mi pantalla, les agradecería mucho. El Comité Ejecutivo Ejecutivo de GLAC ha preparado para ustedes uh, su reporte anual de una manera diferente este año, en respuesta a la pandemia de COVID-19. Su presentación está compuesta de cuatro partes, antecedentes, agradecimiento, logro y por último, recomendaciones. Históricamente, un subcomité de GLAC prepara y entrega un reporte para ustedes anualmente asegurando que estén al tanto de los logros, desafíos y recomendaciones sobre los programas y servicios para nuestros alumnos multilingües emergentes. Esto con el fin de informar el desarrollo del Plan de Rendición de Cuentas y Control Local, o LCAP por sus siglas en inglés, 
Este año, con los cambios a la línea de tiempo de LCAP ahora fijado para diciembre, nuestro comité decidió inmediatamente después del cierre de escuelas hacer una transición rápida. Primeramente, las reuniones de GILAC se condujeron en línea aún antes de que el Departamento de Educación lo requiriera. Un logro que es importante compartir con ustedes, ya que el esfuerzo de este comité ejecutivo ha sido tremendo para poder hacer esa transición. Además, se organizaron para preparar este reporte que se desarrolló exclusivamente en respuesta a la situación en la que se encuentran las familias a causa del cierre de nuestras escuelas. Ahora me gustaría presentarles a nuestro comité ejecutivo y voy a pedir que por favor uh, los agreguen ahora a nuestra reunión. Um, buenas noches a uh, uh, miembros del consejo, el señor Matsuoka, doctor Ramírez y um, todos los presentes. Mi nombre es Marina Zárate y soy una de las copresidentas de DILAC. Buenas tardes. Sí, mi nombre es Margarita Mendoza y yo también pertenezco a DILAC y soy um, otra copresidenta de DILEC. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas eh, eh, noches. Mi nombre es Sergio Naveda y soy eh, presidente asesor de DILAC. Gracias. Bueno. Adelante, Laura. Uh, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Laura Gómez y soy copresidenta del Comité de Tila. Eh, si puede seguir, si no está Víctor, puede seguir Alma. Mi nombre es Alma Rangel, muy buenas noches, soy comunicadora de Tila a la comunidad escolar. Gracias. Ah, bueno, eh, eh, primeramente. ¿Si ¿sí me escuchan? Sí, Víctor, adelante. Eh, buenas noches, disculpen, este, soy Víctor Carmona, soy secretario del Comité de ILA. Ah, bueno, queremos agradecer primeramente al Consejo de Educación por haber escuchado nuestras um, peticiones referentes al nuevo superintendente. También queremos agradecer al servicio de nutrición, a los maestros, al personal de apoyo, al servicio de tecnología, liderazgo y, y del distrito y de las escuelas, a los oficiales de los miembros de TILAC, al personal de mantenimiento y operaciones, y a la unidad de participación familiar y de acceso lingüístico, por su arduo trabajo de cada uno. Muchas gracias. Y también, bueno, queremos decirles a todos ustedes que... Gracias por esta elección del superintendente. Realmente son un orgullo para la comunidad, comunidad latina. Y también queremos dar un agradecimiento especial a quienes han sido los pilares de esta transformación, ya que con su liderazgo y decisión, pero sobre todo por su amor a la educación de niños y jóvenes, lograron hacer realidad este proyecto. Así que honor a quien honor merece. Un reconocimiento especial al señor Matsuoka, y al doctor Ramírez. La historia reconocerá sus esfuerzos y premiará con nunca olvidar su valiosa colaboración para la educación en Santa Bárbara. Gracias, muchas gracias por dejarnos en el futuro. Um, a continuación vamos a um, presentar nuestros logros y uno de estos logros fue Meta. 
la integración de recomendaciones al plan integral para las vías académicas multilingües, la continuidad y respaldo presupuestal a todo programa que apoya la eliminación de la parcialidad implícita y desarrolle comprensión cultural um, en los estudios técnicos. Uh, también uh, Meta fue una recomendación que se hizo hace un par de años y hoy lo vemos como una realidad, claro, después de mucho trabajo de diferentes partes interesadas. Y de igual manera le damos la bienvenida a Edda Maldonado como la nueva superintendente y le pedimos que continúe apoyándonos con el plan Meta. Después de escucharle esta noche, confiamos en que lograremos grandes cambios en este, en este distrito. Bienvenida. Estamos muy emocionados al ver que nuestra recomendación de implementar programas de doble inmersión lingüística se está haciendo realidad. El programa de doble inmersión lingüística DLI del Distrito Escolar Unificado de Santa Bárbara se conforma de hispanohablantes y angloparlantes en las mismas aulas y se les imparten clases en ambos idiomas. Este programa se iniciará en Santa Bárbara Junior High School para el ciclo escolar 2020-2021, maestra Paloma Serrano, y en la escuela primaria McKinley para el ciclo 2021-2022, realizando entrevistas en junio para dos puestos de aquí. Bueno, y considerando que la pandemia de COVID-19 causó el cierre de las escuelas, y siguiendo nuestro lema que es preparar a los alumnos para, el, para un mundo que aún no se ha creado, la pregunta sería, ¿cómo enfocar nuestros esfuerzos y energías hacia una visión colectiva para los alumnos multilingües en este tiempo de aprendizaje a distancia. Adelante, Maggie. Sí, ok. Uh, reporte de recomendaciones. En respuesta a la pandemia de COVID-19 y el cambio hacia la educación a distancia, el distrito colaboró con comunidades justas para ofrecer una sesión virtual condensada del programa FIDA, Familias para la Inclusión, la Diversidad y el Acceso, específicamente para los miembros de los comités ILAC y DILAC. El objetivo de esta sesión era que las familias tuvieran un espacio para dar recomendaciones específicamente acerca de los cambios que se han visto al cambiar la educación a distancia. Recomendaciones Internet. Que el distrito se haga responsable del Internet. Es urgente que todos los estudiantes tengan acceso a servicio de Internet gratis para estar preparados no solo durante una pandemia. El siguiente es que el distrito cubra todos los lugares. La compañía Cox no sirve a todas las regiones. Su, eh, su servicio de Cox no, no cubre en, en la mayoría de, 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 de la región. Um, la tercera, que el distrito se asegure con la compañía que el servicio sea gratis y de buena calidad. Que no sea este un gancho para que las familias gasten más dinero en un upgrade, en un servicio más avanzado de internet. Gracias. Adelante, Laura. Disculpen, tenía apagado el micrófono. A la siguiente recomendación es comunicación más frecuente, enfocándose en los estudiantes más en riesgo, problemas de asistencia y darles prioridad a ellos. El trabajo es mucho uh, de apoyar a los estudiantes en riesgo. Simplificar los portales en donde nos, nos enteremos de información 
como Pérez en Square, Mio, Aries. Eh, la gente, hay padres que no saben todavía cómo usar estas, estas plataformas. También uh, debería existir una encuesta y orientación al principio del ciclo escolar para preguntar cómo es que queremos que la escuela se comunique con familia y en qué idioma. También deben preguntar si las familias quieren capacitación en cómo usar la tecnología para mantenerse conectados, pero tiene que ser para los que ya se reclasificaron, no solamente para ellos, sino también uh, en general. La comunicación de tareas debería ser bilingüe en los grados principalmente de primaria para que los padres puedan entender y no tengan el, pues la barrera ahorita que es de traducir cuando los niños aún no están leyendo. Um, gracias. Y pasamos a la recomendación número tres, que es la educación especial y multilingües emergentes. Estamos pidiendo si podrían revisar que tengamos un taller para las familias para que sepan cómo funciona el aprendizaje a distancia y cuál es el rol del padre en el apoyo de sus hijos. Uh, otro sería una clase adicional. Además de su clase normal, Podríamos agregar tal vez una clase de 15 a 20 minutos con el papá y el estudiante, ya sea por teléfono o por la plataforma de Zoom. La tercera sería reducir el número de estudiantes en Zoom. Otorgar adaptaciones de acuerdo al IP de los estudiantes, otra vez enfatizando a los niños que son multilingües emergentes. Mm. Y um, a continuación, me gustaría um, hacerles una invitación para asistir al, a la próxima reunión de FIDA. Y esta reunión será el miércoles 27 de mayo del 2020, otra vez por la plataforma Zoom. Si tienen preguntas, se pueden contactar con Lena Morán o pueden también, um, ella es la directora de programas y justicia lingüística. El número de teléfono está en la pantalla. Este documento está en español, pero tal vez lo podríamos mandar en inglés si se requiere o no sé si podemos usar Parent Square para mandarlo. Esta es el objetivo del programa FIDA de Comunidades Justas es proporcionar a diversos grupos de padres, tutores, información, herramientas y apoyo para, la, para llevar sus voces a las conversaciones de la escuela y el distrito sobre la equidad educativa y las oportunidades académicas y las brechas de rendimiento y convertirse en líderes para la equidad en la educación en formas que apoyan el éxito de todos los estudiantes. Por favor, únase al grupo de ILAC y DILAC del Distrito Escolar de Santa Bárbara mientras presentan recomendaciones sobre cómo aumentar la oportunidad y el acceso de los estudiantes y las familias durante la pandemia de COVID-19. Una vez más, esto será el miércoles 27 de mayo de 6.30 a 7.30 de la tarde por uh, Zoom. Y ahí está la información de la reunión y la contraseña para accesar. Ojalá que puedan acompañarnos. Con esto um, concluimos el informe anual del Comité Asesor de Alumnos que Aprenden Inglés del Distrito uh, Escolar, por su sigla, que en sus siglas en inglés, ante el Consejo de Educación. Um, pues uh, también me gustaría agradecer a los miembros del consejo por su tiempo, por siempre estar dispuestos a escucharnos y hacer su mayor esfuerzo por ejercer nuestras recomendaciones cada año. De verdad, sabemos que trabajan mucho por nosotros y agradecemos especialmente durante este tiempo que es tan difícil que todas las estamos en casa. Agradecemos de verdad todo el tiempo que se toman para escucharnos y para trabajar en nuestras recomendaciones. Agradecemos también, o agradezco al señor Matsuoka, Mil gracias, doctor Ramírez, y bienvenida a bordo, Elda Maldonado. Y paso a mis compañeros. Gracias. Sí. Um, muchas gracias um, a todos los, los del... Thank you so much. I just want to well, uh, thank you all on behalf of the board. Uh, you've been so diligent about the superintendent process and participating and coming to our meetings when we actually had in-person meetings. Um, so th here we are almost uh, full circle in a sense to hear your annual report. So many, many thanks. Um, I did neglect, uh, Mr. Hill just reminded me that we did have one public speaker 
um, that, so I'm going in reverse order a little bit to have our public speaker speak first before we uh, take questions and comments from the board. Mr. Hill. Yes, President Caps, we have one uh, public comment. So is Ms. Sheridan Rosenberg. Sheridan, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, thank you. Um, so thank you very much um, for getting back to me. I really appreciate it. So two comments. First of all, I love that the PowerPoint presentation was put up in Spanish. And I think it would, because it's very welcoming for people who may not read English fluently. But my comment is I also think if there's any way, perhaps Mr. Um, Rickman could do a split screen with Spanish and English in the future for presentations like that, just like we have the translation in Spanish and English, I think it's just more inclusive and uh, you know everybody can sort of follow along. So that's just one sort of technical comment. And the second thing I notice is I'm, I'm unclear about it, LCAP's role in this. LCAP's mentioned, is this going to be fully funded by LCAP? Do we have a budget on this? Um, I know that LCAP meetings should be public. It's, some of them haven't been public. They haven't been noticed publicly. So uh, I think that we need to do a look back and perhaps have those meetings over again by Zoom, I think works very well, so that we can include the public. I was also sort of wondering how the you know, committee was set up. I mean, I know parents that would love to participate in this and had no idea that there was an, even a committee um, to actually be, be a part of. And I think that in the spirit of inclusivity and equity, I'd really um, love in, to you know, work closer with the board to connect those people that want to um, be heard and, and participate more, including myself. And then um, uh, the obvious thing I see is that Just Communities is woven through this, I mean, a nonprofit uh, sort of partnering with the school district, and now you have LCAP. Um, I think that that's entirely inappropriate. I mean, Maria Larias Horton's husband is the treasurer for uh, Just Communities, or at least he was in the past. You have Sean Carey, who was a staff member. I mean, you have co multiple conflicts of interest, and I don't think we need to uh, necessarily go into much detail this evening about that, but I, I think that really LCAP is a very sensitive subject. This is about $13.5 million a year. How, you know, do we have an idea of what the budget is going to be for this? And I think that we really need to um, maybe even bring in from Sacramento an LCAP expert. Uh, I think that the LCAP has been um, certainly, uh, we've <laughs> run afoul, or maybe there's just a big misunderstanding about what the guidelines and the, and the processes <laughs> proper processes for LCAP are, but um, I, I'm deeply concerned about that, and I think that we should definitely revisit that immediately. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rosenberg, for your public comment. Uh, now I will turn it to the board and for any questions or comments of our uh, presentation. got a lot of people on my screen here so if I don't see you just just holler let's see Ms. Munoz okay um, first of all you know thank you so much for the presentation I always I look forward to this every year and I appreciate you know the updates and the <clears throat> the inclusion of every parent's voice um, in this, and I know that you're so dedicated and spend so many times for the benefit of all children. <clears throat> les, les quiero agradecer por todo lo a preparación que hacen, <coughs> perdón, y por incluir a cada voz en, en este esfuerzo, incluyendo personalmente en participar en, en los talleres. Um, thank you so much also for including myself personally. Um, with the development of this this program and i really you know appreciate every everyone's efforts and participation thank you thank you thank you miss munoz other questions or comments oh good miss ford thank you uh, i 
am very pleased with this report. I too really appreciated seeing it in Spanish. And I think that many of these recommendations for helping our students become more successful going forward at this very difficult time are really thoughtful and logical. And they actually give us an intelligent roadmap forward uh, regarding our special ed students and English learners. So I just say bravo. Dr. Reed. I think I just want to reiterate the comments um, of my sister board members uh, and truly thank you for, again, a very comprehensive um, presentation. And I, I also appreciate the time and effort that went into your consideration around these recommendations. And I think that, again, I think that they are um, ones that we really should consider and look at going forward. I also wanted to just reiterate Ms. Capp's comments because I feel um, that the input from um, the DLAC committee um, from the beginning of the process of the superintendency search was very um, important, as was the voices from the community and others that came forward. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, this group in particular because you're just speaking because there was a great effort put to come to many of the meetings and share the concerns but also the positive work that has been going on in terms of equity and certainly with the leadership of Mr. Matsuoka and the desire to continue moving forward in that direction which um, which we will be doing so thank you very much for your time your effort and for speaking tonight Thank you, Dr. Reed. Okay, Ms. Simsbone, let's make sure. Good. <laughs> I'm actually unmuted. Um, so I, yeah, I too just will, will keep it uh, keep it short. I just appreciate uh, every presentation that you've always brought forth is very clear and concise uh, as to what what the needs are and what you're advocating for your students. That so it's always a good clear path of what it, what you're asking us, and it's very clear as to how those can. Uh, those actions can be implemented. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you advocating uh, on, on a level of just on a high level of what the needs of your students are. And I just appreciate you coming in and doing that. And I appreciate the organization of it. Uh, it is a model that uh, the parents groups can really follow with regards to being very clear on what the needs are and you advocating at the level that you are for, uh, for your students. So thank you very much. And I always look forward to your presentations as well. Uh, Ms. Capps. Dr. Reed, yes. Sorry, I'm sorry, I really did want to acknowledge um, Maria Lorias Horton for her work because her leadership in this with this with this group and committee is just sensational and i think you have really brought everyone together and kept them on track and focused with a plan but including and inclusive of all voices in the process so thank you for your hard work with that and certainly under the leadership of dr ramirez whom we will miss but um, we know that Maria, you're gonna move us forward as well. And I have no question that we will continue to be um, moving forward in a positive way to support um, all of our students. Thank you. I, I think I want to conclude and I'll say this in English, um, if, if it's okay with you, uh, President Cap. Yes, sir, absolutely. Just to say that I echo Dr. Ramirez's comment at the beginning. Um, sometimes we speak about empowering others, but true, truth be told, this committee already has so much agency and power. It's really all about giving them the space and proper protocols for elections into this no. committee. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, you know, this is, this is um, a reflection of their own power and, and their own abilities and agency. So thank you. I know they're very appreciative of, you, of all of you uh, mm -hmm. on the board for listening to them. Um, and I just want to say they've worked many hours, many, many hours between school closures and now to really, re really shift. So uh, kudos to them. So thank you and, and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thanks all around. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move on to the next report item, which is F.
to, I'm sorry, G2, uh, Mr. Matsuoka, please give us up to date on the district-wide solar PV energy and resiliency project. Yes, I'm gonna <clears throat> share my screen. See if I can figure this out. And sometimes it works. Ah, oh, there we go. All right, is my screen visible? Am I unmuted? I'm good. All right, can you folks hear me? All right, see some head nods. All right, before I begin to uh, go through the presentation, I wanted to acknowledge our sustainability committee that has been around for a long, long time. Um, and they have been uh, advocating for sustainability, resiliency, taking care of our planet for, for a long, long time. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the, the key contribution that a local person, Sarah Miller McCune, who I think we all know is such a community icon and leader. And uh, her, she sent me a two-page letter back in uh, August 2019. And uh, you know, when you get a two-page letter from Sarah Miller McCune, you kind of need to pay attention to it. Um, I love Sarah, and she uh, kind of got after me and said, Carrie, come on, you, you need to do something about sustainability. Um, you know, that led to a, a fall process where um, we culminated with a board report about an RFP process on November 12th. Um, wow, we fast-tracked that. We got proposals in. There was only one submittal from the Sage Clean Coalition uh, duo. And the board approved that on December 16th. So here we are, what is it, five months later, and uh, we are on the verge of bringing to you in about, take us about three more months to bring a contract recommendation to enter into a full power purchase agreement um, for solar panels, battery energy storage systems, and in the future, electrical vehicle charging stations. Um, so the board, you've, you've heard this several times, um, but just in case for the public, um, once again, it's explaining the narrative. So what is a power purchase agreement? It's very much like a lease. And you are leasing solar generation capacity that's really built out and owned by a company. And we are leasing that equipment and electricity stream for 25 years. You can liken it to we're gonna buy our electricity from this future company instead of California, Southern California Edison. Now, every site has to stay connected to Edison because when we generate excess electricity, we run it back into the grid. And then at nighttime, when we don't have sunshine, we need power at nighttime for evening events. Um, we will have a small residual bill from Edison um, but we are going to buy the majority of our electricity. The estimate is 94% of our power will be produced by this whole solar panel array system at 15 sites. Financial aspects, uh, we are um, obligated to respect and follow government code 4217 that a, a project like this must demonstrate um, cost savings to the district. And that is built into the RFP process. So I've been uh, kind of a, an observer, participant of power purchase agreements now for probably the last decade of my career. And what I have learned over the last 10 to 12 years is the field of power purchase agreements for school districts has really matured. Um, we've gotten much smarter uh, and it's, it's a much better deal for school districts today. So here's what we are negotiating, and it's in the RFP, that we expect our average price of electricity to be lower than what we are paying today. That there is gonna be no inflation factor on that electricity for 25 years. That in itself is pretty remarkable. Up front, there's no capital cost to us. The company's gonna invest all of their money to build out the system. Um, and I didn't comment in the narrative or in the slide deck, but at the end of the 25 years, uh, I hope I'm still around to celebrate that day, that we're embedding in the language, um, you can 
take the whole array out at your expense because they really own it, but no, no company's going to want to take it out because it's going to be 25 years old. Or you can donate it to the district. And that language actually is going to be embedded in the contract. Now, we can't guarantee that they'll donate it to us because who knows what IRS rules are going to be in 25 years. They can't promise. Um, but that language is going to be explicitly stated in the contract. So let's see if it's installed in about 2022, maybe in 2047, if we're still around, we'll celebrate when, hey, maybe this whole solar system is ours to keep and it will still generate electricity uh, in year 26 and beyond. So the financial benefit to us, um, just so you know, our electricity bill is about a million dollars a year. Um, so our goal is to get it uh, slightly under a million dollars a year. We just pay it to a different provider. Um, the beauty of it is there's no inflation on that electricity bill for 25 years. That, I, I would like that on a lot of things in you know my personal budget. <clears throat> What's been added to this project uh, recently is because of the power shutoff environment that we uh, experienced in Santa Barbara, um, other counties with fire risk. Um, the technology has improved to add the battery resiliency layer. So we identified five sites you can see listed there that will support really critical infrastructure when the power goes out. So protecting our food, uh, our data centers, and, and to keep um, sort of emergency operations going uh, should we lose power across the community. Uh, we identified our three big high schools, La Cumbra because it's on the west side and the district office because we have so much food storage in our data center. Uh, wanted to anticipate the question, how come we're not doing all the sites? Um, it's expensive to put in that resiliency layer and we feel it's important to put it in at the big locations um, you might use it once every five years. It'd be great if we never had to use it. Um, so we, we have to be careful about over-investing in the battery storage system, because otherwise, when you don't need it, it's nice to have, but in a sense, you've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in a typical school site to make that happen. And because we're embedding all those costs in the PPA contract, if we overdo that, we're gonna have to pay more for electricity. So it's a real balancing act. All right, electrical vehicle charging stations. It is kind of a desert out there to charge a car. Uh, Ms. Caps knows this. Uh, I experienced it when my garage was inaccessible. Um, you have to hunt around for a charge charging station. So we are planning out 215 charging stations. Um, we need to add those later because they have to be connected on their separate meter because we have to do a contract with like a charge point or EVgo or some company that runs those. Um, but we will run all the conduit in the ground so that we can put those in at a very reduced cost. All right, this slide's just fun to present. So, and I didn't put all the technical summary, but we're gonna build it out at 15 school sites. <clears throat> um, oh, I didn't update the number. That's actually gonna be about 14,000 panels, not 19,000, but 14,000 solar panels is, I mean, just picture that, that's a lot of panels. Um, I mentioned the 94% power coverage. It's gonna generate 3.8 million kilowatt hours of power every year. And if you're into the CO2 offset, uh, 1,663 metric tons of CO2 um, that is stopped from going into the atmosphere every year. So timeline, uh, the RFP was published last week. Um, today, Mr. Vizzolini and I participated on the webinar. Um, I heard that there were 50 companies interested in our project. Um, the pandemic actually could create a really uh, great negotiation environment because the solar industry has been, you know, taking a hit. Um, so when this project hit the streets, there was a ton of interest. Uh, we're going to get some great competitive pricing. Um, the deadline to submit is, you can see it, June 25th. Interview set for July 9th, and we hope to negotiate and bring a contract to the board on August 25th. Um, if 
Our campuses are in modest sort of pandemic uh, constraints. We might actually be able to get some construction started earlier in the fall. Um, project completion, December 2021. So there is your update about our district-wide PV energy resiliency project. Questions and comments from the board. Amazing. Any questions or comments? Let's see. I can't, I'm sorry, I'm just... Well, I'll, I'll speak. This is um, astounding. Um, as Mr. Matsuoka knows, and my, my board colleagues know, this is, uh, sustainability was one of the reasons why I ran for the school board. At the time, we had no solar. Now we have 12 panels, and soon we are going to have how many exactly? Remind me the number? Uh, about, uh, I think it's between 13 to 14,000 panels. Amazing. So thank you for the, uh, all the work that this represents, all the energy, Mr. Vizzolini, the team, uh, this is a broad scope. It's ambitious, it's bold, and I so appreciate that you included the cost savings and the amazing deals <laughs> that are able to be made now, um, including the 25 year no inflation. So thanks for highlighting all that information. I really appreciate it. And I'm thrilled. <laughs> Any questions? Ms. Munoz. Yes, I just had a question about the um, vehicle, let's see, charging stations. Mm -hmm. Will those be at the different high schools and at the district office? I mean, that's, I mean, the, the number's huge. I just wondered how, how that's going to work. If, if yeah. that's, might be too early to ask that, I really. No, it's, um, so we have specified the number of charging ports at each campus, certainly prorated to the size of the school and size of the staff. Um, and, you know, we don't have a ton of um, parking spaces where we can do it. So, for example, the high schools will have the most, probably about 30 charging ports per high school, junior highs, maybe, you know, 12 elementaries, um, depends on the size of the elementary parking lot. A lot of our elementary parking lots are really small, um, but they'll have a few. So really a progression, large campuses, high schools a lot middle school, some elementaries, you know, enough, maybe four to six, all adding up to 215. And will they only be for staff? You know, no. I know that, I mean, I don't, the cost of, you know, the vehicles and so forth, but I just wondered. Um, well, I would say during uh, school hours that the staff will be parking in those spots most likely, but it can only, they can only park an electrical vehicle. They can't. We're going to put a sign up saying EV cars only. Um, and so that's part of the tension. If we put too many EV charging stations, then our staff won't have enough parking for their conventional cars. So, you know, we have to find that right balance of, I hope that our staff takes advantage of it, that they go electric cars over the next, you know, five to seven years. Um, but we have to be careful about overdoing it because then we won't have regular parking spots. Yes, yeah, that was part of my concern too. Thank you. Ms. Sims, Ms. Sims Wotton. Yes, so, so thank you. Thank you for this presentation, Mr. Matsuyoka. So a couple questions. So is this presentation uh, taking into account what we're gonna have to do now post COVID in terms of the amount of electricity we would use? Um, going forward, that's question number one, and maybe you may have said that. So if you said that, I, I, I missed that and I apologize. And the second question, so according to the power purchase agreement, um, is this something that the district only does or could we like partner with the county who also have electric um, vehicles and moving toward that way? So just to see if there's other partners as a part of this in terms of the county uh, the entire county in terms of coming in part, uh, uh, a part of this agreement or, or is it only focused on just the district? Yeah, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, it is focused on the district because it's a, it's a 25 year contractual agreement between uh, a company and 
a public agency. If the county wanted to develop their own solar system power purchase agreement, then the county would need to do their own RFP process because you know that's the board of supervisors. Versus yeah, I just this. yeah 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 I, know, I understand the process. I was just thinking in terms of would uh, is it separate or could it be a shared cost? But you just answered my question. So. Um, as far as the the COVID impact. That's a tricky thing with designing a solar array system. You know that we've given them our electricity bills for the last three years for every site. They've analyzed our historical need. Um, they have penciled out a design that will cover 94% of our electricity under normal conditions. Now we're still going to reconcile our electricity bills for the last, you know, March, April, May, June. Um, I know our electricity costs are going to be down. Um, and right now, if we overproduced, uh, I'm pretty sure we do not get a credit for extra electricity that we send into the grid. Um, I hope that we don't have to do a pandemic environment, you know, ever again. Um, but if we ever were overproducing, um, what it means is 100% of our electricity costs are covered by the PV arrays. Um, and then Edison would get that that small financial benefit to them. And, and then just one follow up to, you know, you were just saying earlier, and I, I've been trying to move your slide, realizing that it's not my, my screen. Oh, so back which, to that part where you were talking about the savings to the district, uh -huh. uh, that per that code that we needed to make sure that that was a yeah. cost savings to the district. So, so what happens with that cost savings? Where is it going or is it going back into the project? Uh, so electricity is paid for out of the general fund. And okay. so if we save money, it's a benefit to the general fund. Okay. And is there, is, there, is there a maintenance cost? So for instance, the cost that we're saving is going back into the general fund. Is it going back to, uh, um, is it going back to then, you know, do any maintenance that may be required on this project or will it be used elsewhere to cut, you know? Yeah, good question. So because we're leasing this, <clears throat> Uh, the equipment is owned and must be supported. And there is a 25 year almost maintenance agreement on every panel, every inverter, every switch. I even asked about the batteries because the batteries have a lifespan of about 12 years. And they said, no, the, the, lease, the leaseor will be replacing battery systems about halfway through their lifespan. So it is really fully maintenance free on our part. We don't have to do anything for 25 years. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Matsuoka. So before we leave this item, I have a, a couple questions for the board. Actually, just one question. <clears throat> So this is a really complex project. And, you know, I've been working with uh, the SAGE Clean Coalition along with Mr. Vizzolini now for gosh, seven or eight months. Um, I am ready to continue as a volunteer citizen for the interview on July 9th and to actually get into the nuts and bolts of the contract negotiations with the, the, the finalist. Um, but recognizing I'm no longer your official superintendent after June 30th. So my question to you, would you like me to continue in an, an advisory role to bring this through to fruition on the 25th, August 25th? Um, you could, we could defer that to uh, future superintendent Maldonado. Um, but I think she's gonna have her hands full as she onboards uh, under these conditions. So. What are your opinions and preferences? Uh, Dr. Reed. Uh, it seems to me that you have a really good understanding and of the process and, and a comprehension of this whole project. So mm -hmm. I I think in light of the timing, it would make it would be a benefit to have you move forward with this. Uh, so those are my thoughts. 
Excellent. I mean, I uh, thanks for all that you've put into it. I, if you want to continue as a volunteer in this capacity, I think it's fantastic. It's certainly a very technical expertise, and I know how much you have immersed yourself, so I appreciate the offer. Okay, I see some nods, Mrs. Moten. Yeah, so I, I would just ask that too, Carrie, and just in terms of is, you know, as you're doing your transitions plans, what part of it's, I'm done as of June 30th, and what part is like, you know, amendment to keep you on for projects such as complex as this? So would that be payment? Would that be non-payment? I mean, just do you have a plan of how you would then do this? Because this is a very complex, as you said, but we and you, there's a lot of work that's gone into it. And I wouldn't hate to see it kind of be in flux while, you know, rightfully so, that Mrs. Maldonado has to, you know, get on, on critical things. And so just if this is part of your transition plan, I'd like to see that, what your thoughts are with regards to carrying it on, other than just saying being a consultant, but what would you be doing? Yeah, so th this is why I'm, I'm asking it in front of the public with you in a public board meeting. Um, mm -hmm. I do not want to be paid anything for any consulting support for the school district. Okay. Yeah. Period. I, that I, I'm retiring. Um, so any services and support I offer would just be, you know, pro bono. Um, I don't need to be paid as a consultant. Um, as far as other transition things, um, I think Ms. Maldonado and I have many conversations over the next four weeks about, you know, some handoffs. And you're actually going to hear some comments from me in the COVID report at the end about it's really time to start doing some handoffs. Um, this is a key project because it's got a lot of financial technical um, aspects to it. There's a couple other projects that I will be bringing to your attention about um, things that I'd like to work on in retirement. Um, but most of it I'm going to, you know, enjoy like sleep and exercise and <laughs> you know, just uh, trying to slow down my life. But uh, so with regards to this project, I will offer my time as a donation, um, but I will offer my writing of the board report when it comes time to present that contract. You know, and certainly, I mean, know that Craig Price is gonna be instrumental in this because it's gonna involve a 25 year lease contract. Um, so Craig and I have talked about my ongoing support so I'd be glad to extend that um, offer to the district. Okay, well, thank you for that, because I think it's important just to what you said, that it's real clear on what your role in it, so there's no misunderstanding. And I appreciate your willingness to be up and donating this, donating your services um, to the district. So as long as that's clearly in either your transition plan or somewhere in writing, so if we need to pull it up, it's real clear. Mm -hmm. Yep, be glad to. Okay, thank you for that ending conversation. So. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you so much, Mr. Matsuoka. Uh, you're up next again on our budget. If you could um, give us an update, give us a report. Yeah, so the first topic, um, before we get to a, a first glimpse of next year's budget is I wanted to document and build out for the cabinet, for the board, for a uh, future superintendent who now I, I know who she is. Um, the budget develop and monitoring systems that I've been working with really for 14 years. And you've watched these come before you at different moments. I thought it would be helpful to just write it all down. Um, it took 10, 10 pages of narrative to explain it all. Um, I'm not going to go through any of the narrative. You've read that. Um, the slide deck is really pretty simple, but I think I can skip right to the heart of this monitoring system. So I've got my shared screen. It's, is that probably, can you read that on your screens? This, this spreadsheet. <clears throat> um, if you want, you could... Um, not be looking at Zoom, and you could pull this up on your screen. Um, if everybody can see it okay, I can make this, oh, there, there, that's, that's better. better. Okay. Bigger is good. Bigger is good. I totally, <laughs> I, I totally can relate to that, Dr. Reed. So 
In the next report, you're going to see the traditional multi-year projection spreadsheet. Um, and that's how we're going to look at next year's budget. You can liken that spreadsheet as a picture that we take five times a year. And in the narrative, I documented when those five moments are. Certainly adopted budget when you first approve a budget. December, you get your first interim report. March, second interim. Sorry for the calendars. And then still working on a given year, then we adopt the budget for the next year. Now you're starting to look backwards in time. And then finally, first interim, you've closed the books for the prior year. I have been showing this, um, I call it the multi-year projection trends to you. We show them about twice a year. So this is, I call it the movie of now four budget years, because I've been with you for four years. And probably the most important thing to look at is total reserves, because that, what, what that represents is that's just cash. Total reserves equals cash. That's what we have to weather storms, to get through cash flow. And if you look at the 2016-17 year, it started off pretty low, 4.69%. Now, I want you to, I'm gonna slow down here. That's where we thought we would end the year. Okay, that's your adopted budget in June of 2016. And that's where we thought we would end on June 30th, 2017. It's really a look ahead. And as we click through the year, the total reserves went up and went down a little bit and then went up to 13.89%. Okay, so there, there was a lot of moving parts that year. Um, and then we finished that budget cycle with the reserve of 17.36%. Um, none of you were on the board my first fall when I had to negotiate and I, I looked at the cash and things were, they were really tight. And so that year, my first negotiations, I offered 0% at the table. Um, I was not a very popular superintendent in my first negotiation round. Um, but things, things worked out fine that year. And then as you look at the next year, 1718, look at the trend of line 27. Started at 8.81, ended up at 19.19. Wow, another good year when it comes to cash. All right, so finally things start to turn. Um, Ms. Jate has been, by that point, sounding the alarm about deficit spending. All right, the prior years, we did not have deficit spending. We had line eight. We finished the year positive 2.7 million. The blue year, <clears throat> positive 717,000. So finally in last year, the 1819 year, our cash, um, it actually did fine, but the deficit spending landed on our doorstep. Last year we deficit spent 7.3 million. So this year, it will come back to you quickly. We started the year with a deficit spending model of over $11 million. Um, even by December, it was still $11 million. And then the board started receiving constant reports about, okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna tackle this budget. We eliminated half of that budget deficit, 5.5 million. And you're gonna see in the next report that it's, it's probably down this year to about $4.5 million of deficit. Um, this is as far as we've got the data because the next snapshot will be on June 23rd. So I leave you with this, I'll call them movies. Um, and you're gonna start another color movie. Uh, the 2021 budget will have its own set of data and we'll start another year. And so this is going to be really important for the board, cabinet, Ms. Jate, um, uh, Ms. Maldonado, to monitor our cash next year. Um, as a, a community-funded district, we have some protections from the economic challenges that are hitting public ed. Um, but I am concerned about if the state resumes the, I'll call it fair share agreements that we endured back in I think it was 2011, 2013, where we had to give up some money because the whole state was, was short of cash. So 
there's the tool. It's really high level. Um, be glad to answer any questions or hear some comments from the board. Any comments? Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> Just any comments from the board? Uh, yes. Um, so, Carrie, so thank you for this. And Mr. Che, you all are working. I know you say this is Carrie Sheets, so I want to acknowledge that as well. So, so, um, so Carrie, can you talk to the 1920 where we're, I'm assuming we're projecting that, that line 50 is the deficit spending or that's down to where, I think we started at 11, so now we're at 6.4 deficit at six, spending? 6.4 as of March. And uh, I'll tell you what, um, I could pull up. Um, looks like we're going to end. Oh, so the, the this was um, detailed out in the, the next board report. The okay. deficit that is going to show is 7.2 for this year. But inside of that board is we are saving $2.5 million um, out of that. So if I can just give me a second. Our net deficit this year is going to be about 4.77 million. That's where we'll probably end up at the next report in June. Now, there are still a future look back. When we close the books on this year, cash will flow out because we didn't spend all our money. So I think the deficit spending for this year will end up down in the $3.7 million when everything's all said and done. So are those the costs that you and the fiscal team have identified that either we don't need it at the level we were or, so how did we get down to three? I know, you know, you started to, to talk about, you know, spending and reducing trips and all of those things, but that's a huge, uh, you know, decrease in terms of what we were looking at. So can you, uh, expand on how we got there and then also what is making up that 3.7 ultimately uh, continued deficit spending? Yes, so we got you to about March. We had projected saving half of it, 5.5 million. It took another couple months to just get all that recorded in accounting. Um, here's what's also gonna show up. The, the last, wow, three months of school, um, our spending in some areas has gone way up, but our spending in some areas has gone way down. Like there's no travel and conferences going on. Uh, our utility bills, we haven't actually gotten those bills yet, um, but there's a lot of contracts where, wow, we don't need them the last three months. So I think that's what's gotten from the 5.5 down to the 4.77 number. Mm -hmm. And there are still you know, monies that are gonna just float out of this, this current year budget because we just haven't been able to spend money because of being under COVID. And will you, okay, so that makes sense under COVID. So going, hopefully we're coming out of COVID, realizing that we're gonna be, you know, look a lot differently. So do you think those costs that we're not incurring as a result of that, will they, will they return in, you know, pre, uh, post COVID? And so therefore, I mean, I'm looking at this deficit, is that a, you know, a real number? Is there something more, is there something more realistic? Because some of those costs will return. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, let me go back to the question you asked. So what's, what makes up the, the final deficit number? Yeah. Um, a big part of that is the mandated funds and the one-time funds that we had been receiving the prior, like three years ago, I believe. Okay. And, and we've held those, we've spent them down, spent them down. So I would say part of that is spending down one-time monies. Um, but there's also probably a bit of overspending still embedded in our budget. Um, so I would say when we get down below $3 million, um, 
I would say part of it is the spending down of those one-time monies, and part of it is still some deficit spending models. So the next question you added, uh, what staff is doing right now is assessing contracts for next year. We're budgeting uh, what we think are appropriate amounts. Um, we're not removing those from the budget, but we're, we anticipate that we're gonna save some money on some of these contracts because if we're under a scenario two partial school opening scenario, there are some things that we still can't do. For example, travel and conferences, um, we're just gonna lower that expense for next year because I don't think we're flying anywhere soon. I don't think we're traveling to conferences. Um, so um, there are still opportunities to save money even when we come out of hard shutdown. Um, and some of those models are built into next year's budget. Okay, and then a, a, a question I think I talked about it a little bit earlier. So just given the report that we were given with regards to food services and the concerns with that, I know we're addressing that some of that as we make the changes, you know, structurally. So um, that concerns me in terms of it. Will we were we still going to be in a deficit? Uh, with re with regards to our food services going into that, and is that part of this 3.7 deficit spending, or have we kind of got a little bit more handle on that? Because that's actually going to change too, right, as we go back into our hybrid model, and that's already um, a shaky ground for us. So, but how do we how do we shore that up? Whether that's through structure or whether that's you know I don't know because I I have a question in regards to we're now uh, providing supper, and my question would be. Is that reimbursable now? Or are we are we incurring that cost on our own? Just just trying to better understand what 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 the you know that deficit that you that was presented to us two weeks ago, sure. uh, or maybe now a couple months ago with regards to those costs of that. I just want to make sure that we're looking at that in a balanced way. I feel like we're moving into the next board report. Oh, okay. Um, which is uh, adopted budget. So why don't we just go ahead and say, all right. You know, monitoring systems, let's move on. Let's go, because we're now diving into the adopted or the proposed adopted budget. And I loaded up what I thought was the slide deck and I just get, okay, here we go, all right. Slides. So budget projection for next year. Um, let's let the team present the, the pieces of this report and then, then we'll circle back into your questions about next year's budget. Um, by the way, this is a report that we really wanted to get to the board this year in May, even pre-pandemic. Um, because it's just helpful for the board to make sense of a $180 million budget over at least a couple board meetings. So your final approval will be in a month on June 23rd. Um, if there's you know, needs for further information between now and then, uh, we'll be glad to get that to you. So we have four highlights. Um, we'll summarize, and some of these questions have already been arising about, so how is this year gonna finish out? Then we're gonna go to a high level overview of next year's budget. And we'll be glad to go into the medium layer. We'll be glad to go into you know, detail. Um, Meg's gonna update the board about the, the impact of the governor's May revise. Um, it's actually mostly good news for us with, with some challenges. And then we'll just outline some of the adjustments in the budget that will happen between tonight and your adoption on June 23rd. So I saw Lacey on the invite list. I was gonna invite her to speak to this first slide, summary of the current fiscal year. I am here. There she is, okay. So we've kind of already gone over a lot of these numbers, as you saw on the NYP trend spreadsheet. Um, about a year ago, we were estimating a deficit of $11 million. And we've gotten, gotten that all the way down to uh, $4.8 million. Um, now with the transfer to fund 17 of 2.5 million, then that will move our deficit back to 7.3 million. 
but it's um, important that we have this money stored away in what we like to call our rainy day fund. Um, Carrie, Carrie um, also mentioned earlier about the one-time funds that we've spent down um, that was contributing to the deficit. Also in the deficit, Wendy, as you had mentioned earlier, is um, transfers to food service in the current year. We um, are projecting to transfer 1.9 million and that is part of that $7.3 million deficit. So with all of this uh, deficit spending, we will still end the year with a total reserve of 12.36%, um, part of that coming from the general fund and part of that coming from our special reserve fund 17. Any questions on this slide before we move on? Thanks, Lacey. All right, I'm just pulling a, just high level um, thoughts. This is out of the narrative. I thought what's important for the board and for our community to understand is as a community funded district, um, we have the benefit of relying on local property taxes for our income. Um, we will not be as affected by the decisions in Sacramento, um, which are going to affect, now the new term is if you're an LCFF district, it used to be called revenue limit, but an LCFF district are receiving some really, some really tough financial numbers right now. Um, you're going to hear stories of other districts that are going to face some really tough circumstances. Um, know that we are for now immune from that. Um, but we have to protect against two things. What if property taxes struggle? Or I think this is the more realistic concern if the, the state says, okay, all of you community funded districts, it's time for you to share in the giving. And we went through that in, um, Meg, it was what, 2011, 2012? Well, 13. Yeah, okay. Um, it's important to know. So assessed valuation is what we are going to count on. And uh, we've been operating with a 4% assessed valuation growth. Um, Meg and I have talked about this for the last, honestly, month, and we're going to go with a 3% number. Uh, it's conservative. If the number comes in at 4%, when you get the, the accounting next November, um, the district will be able to add $1.4 million back to the income line. And in the new projection, we're actually going to start showing the assessed valuation percentage growth because that's now the new number that's important to us. Um, total expenditures, um, line 12, that's important to monitor. That's, our, that's what generates uh, deficit spending. Now, right now, line 13, we have a net loss of $5.3 million. So that's up as of tonight. Um, we have another month to keep working on the budget. We think it will get slightly better. Um, what's going to improve that number a lot is after we close the books and we see how much cash flows out. Um, but right now, that's what the number is looking like. Uh, a year ago, we were starting the year at $11.5 million deficit. So that's good progress. Um, the total reserves will begin the year at a healthy number, 8.76%. And then to Ms. Sims Moten's question about the food service budget, um, this budget model includes a $4 million deficit in food services next year. And uh, we'll just explain quickly, that assumes a model where worst case scenario, let's say we were closed for half a year again. And that's that $25,000 a day loss. If we're open at 50% level, um, a lot of income comes back, um, and so we're not quite sure how to model that until we know what school looks like. So we have budgeted the worst case scenario of a $4 million deficit in food service, and um, that's, that's not a fun number. So, so Carrie, is that, um, that deficit, that, that's just, that's really scary and almost unacceptable in terms of, is there something, what are we doing? Um, and I understand that this is the worst case scenario, so I, I, I get that, but I, I'm looking more for um, structural 
deficits that keep having us be deficit, if you will, in the food services? What are we doing to minimize that? And again, I know that we've talked about, you know, being reimbursement levels or different things. So I'm just trying to really get a good um, picture because this is going to keep coming up. And so far, it's only been going up. And I, you know, again, I understand um, it being worst case scenario, but let's just stay at worst case scenario. What are we doing? Can I, Carrie, can I clarify something? The $4 million deficit is actually not the worst case scenario. That's six months in COVID, six months out of COVID. So the worst case scenario would be 100% in COVID. I just want to clarify that, that we, I picked the middle range, hoping that we would be at brick and mortar by January. So will we still be able to, okay, thank you for that. So will we still be able to um, address some of the issues we had before this? So we had issues where we were, you know, we had some structural issues before that. So have we addressed those? Would you like me to answer that, Carrie? Um, um, let me take a first pass at it, Meg. Um, we have spent four board meetings on this difficult topic. We have brought you our recommendations. Um, <clears throat> the biggest is we are overstaffed. Our labor costs are too high. And I, I don't want to replay our last four board meetings, but Ms. Sims Moten, to answer your question, we are overstaffed. So we will do all that we can to improve our reimbursement. Uh, we will be as efficient as possible. We will run our kitchens as efficient as possible. But we have presented to you, or the problem is we are overstaffed. So you're gonna to get to December next year, actually before December, I would say at some point in the fall, you should receive an update from the finance team and the food services team. And now we'll have three months of real data. So Ms. Jate did point out, I, I, that's true. The worst case scenario is if we were closed full distance learning at home for a full school year. And I don't, I don't even wanna think about that number on the deficit. So for her to kind of split the middle, that's assuming we're closed for half a year and then we're open to some degree for half a year. It could go, maybe we're open starting August 18th and that $4 million deficit will get better. But the biggest issue is labor costs. Okay, and, and, and not wanting you to rehash it, I just was thinking that, it's, uh, again, thinking outside the box, I know you guys have really been thinking about how do we do it in terms of getting it down because this, I understand um, the importance of making sure that our students are, are fed you know, in terms of that. So I'm just trying to make sure we can sustain it uh, in terms of that, that they, they continue to get fed at the high quality that we are able to do it right now. And so that's, it's not about rehashing, it's just about are, are there other ways that we can think, I understand about labor, so it may be a further conversation about the road, but it, it, it's not gonna go away. And that's where you hear me saying that. Um, and so how do we balance this in terms, again, as I said earlier, I think our, our passion has exceeded our, our heads, <laughs> unintended. So I'm just, I'm just trying to think, how do we then get back in balance with regards to that and know that you're doing everything and I, I appreciate um, what you're doing. So, um, but it will still be a question when I look at a $4 million deficit and if it's just about labor, then what else other conversations do, do we need to have to, have to balance that out? Um, to look at that. So I, I want to acknowledge the work that you've done and, and all the conversations that we've had, um, but it still comes down to that we have a deficit in here and I'm just trying to, to not, um, not just uh, not talk about it, right? So just how do we keep talking about it so that we're, we get this down where it, where it makes sense. Meg, do you wanna add anything to that? Um, I just want to let you all know that with the vended contracts, we have set a, um, a dollar amount that will cover our costs. So we will not be bleeding. If they accept the contracts, we will not be bleeding in that area. Um, but we have not gotten any of the contracts back or approved you know, from any of our outside vendors. And with the CAC vent report, um, contract, they're going month to month. Okay. Well, that's, that, that's good to know. I mean, when we're looking at it, we're, we're actually, you know, looking at it through open eyes, uh, you know, in, in terms of that and that we continue to want to, again, 
um, work through it, work on it, because I'm sure all the other vendor contractors are dealing with the same issues in terms of just COVID, you know, throwing everything in a, in a throws. But I, I still want us to, I just want us to keep with their eyes open with this. Okay. Uh, I think we move on a little bit just to, okay. to, to keep, keep us moving, in my okay. opinion. All right, so Meg, I'll let you speak to the May revise. Sure. So it is just a May revise, what the preliminary um, governor suggested, but it is making its way through its process. And um, for Carrie mentioned that um, we aren't as affected by this due to the property taxes. So you'll hear out there, there was a 10% cut. The net cut is about 7.92% to the LCFF districts. Um, where does that affect us? It affects us in the supplemental. And because that does get decreased, that's the LCAP money. So that will be decreased. And if we got concentration, that would have been decreased also. Uh, the good news is for us, since we aren't a LCFF district, um, the reduction in PERS was huge. PERS and STIRS was about $2.1 million. That was a tremendous help for the districts. Um, and then uh, we got some special ed money. They kept it in the budget as the January proposal, which we, all of us thought that that would have been the first thing that went, but they kept it in. I did read a little bit today about some of the process into the um, developing the budget or finalizing the budget, they're talking about taking that out. I'm really hoping Newsom puts his foot down and says, no, we're not gonna cut special ed. Um, we got some big cuts in the after school program, that's ACES, and our CTE grants were cut by 50%. Um, and also our um, California partnerships, 50%, which is the MAD and VADA um, revenue. So, but all in all, we have done fairly well. Now, if they start in on the basic aid fair share, um, I've been reaching out to some of the people that I've been talking to and explaining to them when we went into basic aid in 11, 12, we were deficited into basic aid because there was a 22% deficit on the revenue limit districts. And so, or 12, 13, sorry. We, we were, our funding was decreased and has continued to decrease a million dollars since 12, 13. So I keep saying we've been reduced our, 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 our funds from the state, even though we were LCFF those entire times until we solidly went into basic aid today or this year. Um, so we've given our fair share for seven years and that should be looked at and taken into consideration. And they agree, but let's see if the state does. So, um, but I don't believe that we will be hit with a basic aid fair share in 2021. Um, but possibly 21-22. So 21-2021 looks good. We have to prepare for 21-22. At this moment in time, I want to say that because it changes quite rapidly in this environment. Yes, Ms. Ford. I just feel compelled to also mention that this budget really hurts charter schools. Well, they are basically an LCFF district. That's right. So they do have to cut a lot. They cannot be a basic aid district. We cannot fund them more than their base grant. So yes, that's correct. Yeah, at one point I, I was on a call with our partner charter leaders and, and I, I was pretty sure I knew the answer to that question, but when I asked it, they were, they were pretty sober. Um, I know the Adelante board was having to meet pretty urgently to figure out how to cut for next year. So yeah, our three charter schools are gonna have some really tight budgets. Fortunately, all three of them have pretty good reserves and that's the importance of having reserves yep. for these times. 
So last slide, um, literally information is changing every week. Um, we have to monitor multiple channels. Um, I keep pushing our team, I keep asking them this number and they keep saying, oh, well, I'm not quite sure, but uh, I will say that this budget that we're presenting tonight is about 95% accurate uh, to what we're gonna present on June 23rd. Um, if there's any major changes, uh, we will certainly update the board via the Friday letter. Um, so questions, any other final questions? You know, all in all, I, I wish we could have presented a, a budget model for next year that had um, a better opening story. Um, but given the circumstances, um, it's, it's a good budget. It's not something to, you know, go home and celebrate over. Um, but I like that our reserves are continuing to go up, that our right now projected deficit spending is manageable. Um, and just know that your staff is looking at just every, every contract, every nook and cranny, um, just looking at how to conserve money next year. I think Meg's pointed out the political risk is in 2122. Um, so my recommendation, let's do all that we can to conserve cash next year. Thank you, Mr. Matsuoka. Other questions? Comments? Okay. Okay, how do you stop sharing a screen? Hey, Todd, how do you stop sharing a screen? Where is it? Should be at the bottom, right? Yep. There. Okay. There, somebody fixed it for me. Okay, last report, the superintendent's COVID report. Um, sorry it got to you like at 5 p.m., um, but it's been crazy. And it's, it, it's shorter and uh, for several reasons. So let me pull it up. And board, if you didn't get a chance to read it, I would encourage you to just pull it up on your screen. It'll just be helpful as I kind of walk you through. It's really only a page long. So remember two weeks ago when I was presenting those three scenarios. One is we stay in full distance learning. Scenario two is um, kind of a hybrid half come to school, half stay home at any given moment. And then scenario three is back to normal. Um, I was pretty pessimistic about any chance of opening school August 18th with, with students at school. But look how the world's changing, both from a, a science standpoint, and I think from a public decision point. Um, you know, the, the science is getting better, the infection rates are going down, um, Santa Barbara's done really well as a county. Um, I, I would say California has been uh, successful at flattening the first curve. Um, notice how I added first. Um, I will probably endure, you know, future curves. So what, uh, oh, this is the wrong one. That's from, that we think a scenario two um, is what we should start planning for. And so that's really a pivot from two weeks ago. Um, even negotiations, our first time, we were talking pretty solidly about full distance learning. But tomorrow when we meet, um, we are ready to start talking about that, that hybrid model. Um, I know that there are just lots of needs for our parents, our staff, our community. Um, and so what I, I just wrote out this afternoon is, so the framework for planning for next year, I see three really important steps. Uh, one is to engage very regularly with SBTA. Um, I appreciate Karen's collaboration with us, and that's gonna be critical. 
Um, and the reason why we need to be at the table with them is whatever model we go with, um, it's, a, it's just a significant change in their work environment. And so we need to negotiate with them. Um, second, um, we've got to figure out a communication and feedback loop with our employees across the district. Um, I mean, we can't hold a conversation with 1,600 employees. We have to figure out how to test models, get feedback, and build those, those loops really quickly. And then uh, my last meeting with uh, Laura and Rose, we talked about uh, parent input, and I know you're receiving input. Um, we want to collect a broad stakeholder set of input through a survey. That survey is being constructed this week, and we are hoping to push that out early next week. Um, and, you know, we're going to be testing questions um, about comfort level of sending kids back to school. And then also asking, you know, what are your concerns? Um, and, and we'll even ask questions about how the spring has gone. Um, it's an opportunity to collect input from our, our parents. So those are things that are, uh, I would call, in production. Um, I, I'm just going to share a really important, it's a short paragraph, but it just I wanted to communicate it with the board. Uh, our next, I have two more school board meetings with you as your superintendent. Um, next Monday is June 1st. And what we started to realize in cabinet is a handoff of, of leading this efforts about opening school really needs to pass, be passed on to cabinet. Um, I'm excited for Hilda coming on board, um, but she's gonna have a lot to learn. And designing a whole new school model in your first two weeks as a superintendent would be a really daunting task. So, we in cabinet today started talking about a transition and a handoff where I would step sort of out of that lead role. I'll stay present. I will, I will be an advisor to the team. But in June, it's really important that the cabinet team start holding all of the architecture of this, the nuts and bolts, the communication, um, because it's the cabinet that's going to be the continuity um, when Ms. Maldonado comes on board. And I think they're, she's going to have to rely on this team to you know, carry through the, the July and August planning and implementation. Now, her voice is going to be needed very quickly because these are just uh, very unusual circumstances. Um, but that's what we felt in cabinet literally today is we recognize that a handoff has to begin um, because come June 30th, and, you know, when my voice and my planning and my writing isn't there, um, we just want that handoff to be happening over a month instead of like the last week. So I conclude the, the report with that comment. Um, I know my cabinet's watching and listening and processing. Um, we, we have been having lots of processing moments with inside your executive cabinet over the last few weeks. So I'll stop there. Questions, comments? Ms. Ford. I, um, I'm glad that you noted that this report was really short and I know that everyone has been really busy and I've tried to acknowledge that earlier, but at the time when the report has gotten shorter and shorter, and I feel like the board knows less and less, is the time when I think the community and the board have more and more questions. So I guess my request now is for and to the cabinet, but I just like to see and hear an in-depth report at the next meeting. As you started out, department by department, one that includes actual data, and roses and thorns about the process. And I also was hoping that you would consider a two-track system for the remainder of 2020, just because some version of a hybrid um, plus 100% distance learning strand is I think going to be popular with people. M many of the districts I'm in contact with are saying this is what they have to offer because lots of parents aren't willing to send their kids to school in any form in August at this point, or until we have a vaccine or something. So I, I appreciate your willingness to consider my request for a more in-depth report and also considering a two-track 
possible system? Uh, it is our intention to bring a report on June 9th. Um, as much as we've got figured out in the next, really we have seven work days before board agenda is due. Um, we'll have two more negotiations with SBTA before we put that report uh, in the next agenda. But yeah, Ms. Ford, I, I totally hear you and uh, respect and appreciate the, the anxiety that's there. Um, the problem solving on this is um, just over the top. The, the real tension around like starting to settle in on a plan, conditions could change on us and then those plans have to be tossed aside. And that's the, the burnout fatigue of decision making on this, the, the people that you see in these boxes is really high. Um, but we're gonna I'm do not discounting any of that. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying we're the board and I think we have a responsibility to know more. Yeah, I, I respect what you're saying on that. You know, the, we've talked about the question of choice already. Um, you, you talk about, well, maybe some families want the hybrid model, but some families want full distance learning because they're afraid. Um, with choice comes uh, greater and greater complexity. I know. So uh, we, were, we were attracted to that, and then we started thinking through the logistics of how do you divide up your workforce where some are doing you know, hybrid model and other people are doing full distance learning. I mean, that, that just has to be negotiated, so. Other comments, questions, concerns? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just, oh yeah, Ms. Sims Martin. Gotta mute, unmute. Yeah, this is a quick comment. Um, just as we're meeting at the department head level um, at the county, one of the things is that we're also asking our department heads, we're really looking closely at how the schools are coming back slowly, you know, what hybrid, because that also will determine how we come back in terms of, do we continue the level of telecommuting? Are we doing, you know, if we're doing three days off, so how do we do that? So we're really watching this very closely well as well with regards to do that. So we want to be a partner in that and how this is going to impact the greater workforce, how people are going to either work from home, you know, uh, and what does that mean for your, uh, the work that still has to be done in this new, in this new way, how we're going to get to work. Yeah. Yeah, we recognize that we are so integral to the lives of yep. probably 12,000 parents, the workforce. And, and it's also the flip. If, what if the workforce opens up and parents start going back to work and we still have kids at home? So uh, the amount of coordination is really important. Um, yeah, and I mentioned that uh, communication with our partner districts and charter schools is happening on a weekly basis. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Reed. Yeah, I just wanted to, I think the transparency would be, I mean, I agree with Ms. Ford, we, just like a rollout of, of what is, what is, what would it happen, what would it be in a hybrid format? What would it be, what would it actually look like? Because we've been talking about this for so long, but to have just, what does that look like? How does that impact our students and the teachers and, and I, I, you're saying that you meet and you, with the, uh, the partnering districts on a regular basis. Does anyone have a, a specific plan that they've actually started to roll out? I mean, that they think is gonna be the way to go in terms of hi, a, a hybrid model that, I just feel like it seems like it's so nebulous when it's gonna happen literally, <laughs> you know, it's right around the corner. Well, um, so two questions there. Um, the partner districts are formulating their own design teams. I haven't seen any of their models yet. Um, and they're also really wanting to hear from us because our secondary schedule will really af uh, affect, you know, our partner districts in terms of synchronization of the parents' lives of, you know, a family with a kid in the junior high and the elementary school, even if they're, they're in Goleta. Um, you know, the, the building of models, um, it's, I, I wish we had more time, but we don't. I mean, August 18th is, is going to come sooner or later. 
So the clock is going to be just on us through the whole summer. Um, you know, the challenge of us building a model, um, we, you know, that's why I open with SBTA is such an important partner because um, we have to build a model that they can um, work with us and support. So board, I totally respect the, the urgency and the, the concern that you have for lack of information. I acknowledge that. Um, we'll, we'll start, we're gonna make some progress tomorrow. We meet with SBTA and, and we've rolled out to them some of the designs that we thought of a couple weeks ago. We wanna get their feedback on it. Um, it's gonna be important to start sharing some models soon with our teachers and our partner districts because whatever schedule we build as we're such a big influencer on the whole K-12 system locally. So. Ms. Munoz. Yes, yeah, and as, as um, <clears throat> Ms. Ford and, and Dr. Reed said, you know, the more, the sooner that we can um, get some insight as to what it looks like, that would be helpful. Because we do get questions from parents every day as to whether we're looking at a hybrid model, you know, four days a week versus five days a week, you know, et cetera. So yeah, the sooner the information's available, that would be helpful to us as the board. Great, um, thank you, Ms. Munoz. So yeah, just can you, uh, maybe you, you said it, but on the survey, what's the time frame on that or next step? Yeah, we're finalizing the questions this week and um, we're gonna try and push it out on Monday or Tuesday. Um, cool. and the, the urgency is the last day of school is Wednesday. Now, yeah. I think our parents are going to stay engaged with us through the summer because, you know, they're going to be really wanting to hear. Um, I, I actually anticipate, uh, doing some tracking surveys over the summer. We're trying to de design the survey so that every three to four weeks we can roll it out again with the slightly modified set of questions so that we can we can see the changes in perception of our parents. Um, I think our parents, you know, all of us are weighing that risk management decision about, well, do I, do I go out? Do I gather with friends? You know, all those questions. And for parents, as they think about sending their children to school, um, to, these are really important big questions. Yep. Okay, thank you. I think that we might be coming to the end here. And I'll just reiterate, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge that we, we get that things change. And so, but it's still good to see models, to learn what other districts are doing that you find of interest. Um, we're hearing it, you know, you're talking about it. I think just, just bringing the board in, bringing the public in, uh, understanding that, that this is a very, you know, this is, things change, but we, we, we're sophisticated enough to understand that <laughs> pivots happen and then you shift gears and having, having different scenarios is what we need at this point. So, yeah. okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Matsuoka and the team. So Laura, you muted. Is that by mistake? Uh, just looking at the agenda here, I believe we're at the end of it. Yes, we are. So uh, what a great meeting. Thanks to everybody for joining. Thanks to those who've been, participating uh, and to the staff, to the team. Uh, we are at, I guess I should say any coming events, but they're probably all, they're probably all vir uh, virtual, although I know uh, we are immersed in graduations. Um, anything there any, that anyone wants to share or future agenda items? <laughs> probably be too long of a conversation on the graduation front, so. Uh, just reiterate the thanks on the graduation front, and we will move on to the final uh, item here, which is adjournment. And we will see you all. I hope it's a wonderful last several days of school, last wonderful celebrations. We're making the most of this. People are working hard, and I'm grateful. Okay, with that. Thank you to all of you. Yes, I adjourn this meeting at 10.09 of the Board of Education on May 26th. Thanks all around. Thank you. Thank you.